primary purpose to the tactic of the fake ban is to promote mystery. Essentially, it is a uh, tactic, possibly well known, of the confidence artist, the con man, swindler or drifter. But it's a trick. It pretty much comes down to the concept of, oh, this is this is too extreme for you. You can't handle this. And of course, that person is going to try and prove that they can, at least those that are susceptible to it. However, when you think about this tactic for five minutes, it usually becomes really obvious when somebody is doing a false ban. <clears throat> and it's uh, it, it means that the object is actually not very desirable. They're attempting to sell it to you, right? Salesmen use this tactic all the time as well. The salesmen in, in essence today are con men. At least that's how the training goes. So let's look at some examples to get a better understanding of what exactly is a false ban. Perhaps one of the most famous examples is the Anarchist Cookbook. According to Wikipedia, the Anarchist Cookbook, first published in January 1971, is a book containing instructions for the manufacture of explosives, rudimentary telecommunications, freaking devices, and related weapons, as well as instructions for the whole manufacture of illicit drugs. Not illicit drugs, right? Not prescribed drugs, but illicit drugs, including LSD. It was written by William Powell at the apex of the counterculture era protest against the United States involvement in the Vietnam War. Powell converted to Anglicanism in 1976 and later attempted to have the book removed from circulation. Well, that's pretty easy when that individual never existed and it's fiction. However, the copyright belonged to the publisher who continued circulation, circulation until the company was acquired in 1991. It's legality. It's entirely legal because it's written. Uh -huh. Has been questioned in several jurisdictions. Anyway, this uh, person who wrote it is likely a pseudonym and doesn't exist. And the so-called copyright belongs to a juridic person. That's how it, these things usually go. Now, the book itself is a piece of garbage, uh, as this Wikipedia article uh, subsequently mentions once in a very small era, area. But <clears throat> the effort that they go through to get this book out there is a perfect example of the false ban tactic. Content summary. Forward, the anarchist cookbook begins with a forward section detailing the author's intentions for the text. At the time of writing, Powell, that's a pseudonym by the way, believed that the United States was slowly declining towards communism. This is a person writing from the perspective that declining is negative, it's a bad, right? Of course, negative is used as a word for bad, even though it isn't necessarily declining, could be a good thing. Like, you would like the numbers of... Uh, of uh, addictions to opiates, right? You'd like that to decline. <laughs> so declining is not always a bad thing, but if the, most people use it to be always a bad thing. Anyway, thus he found it necessary to write a book that guided people on revolution against this transition. So of course, naturally, they're trying to uh, label revolution as a bad thing by association. Thus, he found it necessary to write a book that guided people. Uh, wait, uh, he championed the idea of bringing America back to where she was 200 years ago. So, what they're trying to do here is they're attempting to isolate the idea of restoration of the republic and associate it with the anarchist cookbook, right? Far right extremism as they're attempting to say it. But of course, the Anarchist Cookbook <coughs> is in fact uh, considered mostly a left extremist thing nowadays. So that's an interesting thing. It's it's a gambit, right? It's a, a piece in their game. So here they're attempting to marginalize, to put into a margin, to reduce to a caricature the concept of legitimate law 
which would be the restoration of the Republic. Just like how they state that jo jokingly, when they do whatever they want, basically, that the Second Amendment applied to muskets. Despite the fact that people had rifling back then, which is the term where rifles come from. So then, of course, you have the NRA, which is uh, equally with all the other groups, uh, effectively instituting uh, and undermining and weakening the national defense through so-called gun control, even though it relates to many other things. And, of course, this book also has the purpose around uh, the criminal and foreign regulation of explosives or other types of um, weapons, right? Anyway, believing his revolutionary ideals to be reactionary rather than proactive. It doesn't make any difference, that, that comment there. Of course, this is probably written by a high school, college student who's being forced to do it and exploited for free labor. Powell begins with his vision for the book and how it is intended to educate the galvanize and galvanize the public to make tangible change in their home countries. Powell states that fringe political organizations such as the Minutemen and the Weathermen are not intended audience. Rather, it is written for the silent majority. Yeah. So this, uh, this article was written much later in comparison and that silent majority in quotation marks is highlighted specifically because it's used as a moniker for followers of Trump. Powell envisioned the United States people rebelling against what he did to be oppressive capitalistic ideals and to a lesser extent against fascist and communist movements. So here in this paragraph alone, the writer cannot determine whether or not this person is on the so-called political left or the political right. Because equally puts them into both categories considering that the caricature is talking about uh, anti, being anti-fascist, right? Like Antifa. And all these other talking points. They're all, they are all just, talk, just talking points. It's all about labels and emotionalism and sensationalism. It's not actually about um, the concepts or what's legitimate or not. Content. Powell begins the content of his book by discussing anarchy and anarchist theory. Anarchy, by his definition, is a wide-scale mass uprising by the people. Similar to that of civil disobedience through violence. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to read these articles because they're not written by people who are very intelligent. But that's what happens when you have people who are trained to be um, lab monkeys in the school system and uh, trained to be ex easily exploited for free labor. He believed that anarchy was the innate state of all individuals and therefore human nature would drive people to participate in such practices. Powell believed that current expressions of politics, art, music, and education all contained innate principles of anarchist ideals, thereby equating anarchism to individualism. This principle drives Powell's argumentation, as he believed that the current political climate in the Vietnam War had undermined human values. Therefore, revolution based upon his perception of human dignity and freedom was what drove him to write the piece. He ends his introduction by warning of the seriousness that these recipes may have deadly consequences if used improperly. Chapters of the Anarchist Cookbook include descriptions and detailed instructions in hand to hand combat, explosive booby traps, drugs, tear gas, sabotage, demolition, surveillance, surprise weapons, and other topics related to anarchism. Now, it should be important to notice that with all this backstory for the caricature, there's clearly a false person, <coughs> a pseudonym or false name, pen name, whatever you want to call it. Most of this stuff is available in military manuals freely and also to a much more effective extent and a much more well-versed uh, extent written by people who know what they're doing. This book is not designed to teach any of that stuff. Most of the things that are included in it are crap. This book is designed to present a pretext to target individuals they associate with the fictional creation that they then fake ban to promote and spread around and use it as an excuse. They use it as an excuse to target their enemies. Legal reviews. At the time of its publication, one FBI memo described the anarchist cookbook as one of the crudest, lowbrow, paranoic writing efforts ever attempted. The book was reviewed by the Department of Justice, the White House, the FBI, and both John Dean and Mark 
Felt, Richard Nixon's lawyer, and FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover's associate director, respectively. So these people do virtually nothing that they pretend to do, right? What they declare to do. Instead, what they do is they spend all of their time working in a propaganda mechanism, and anything that they put their focus on is either to um, to mystify or obfuscate what it is, or it's to focus entirely on something that is one of their creations and designed to capture the perspective. They're, um, they're con men, right? So, also, when you talk about, say, restoration of the Republic and restoring the legitimate law of the Constitution, somebody can then say, oh, you sound like you've, um, you've been stud studying the Anarchist Cookbook, right? So that's their little game that they play. Just like they, that sounds like anti-Catholic sentiment. When you say uh, Jesuits in the Vatican changed the laws of free countries and also committed uh, heinous acts against people for crimes they committed a long time ago and then got punished for, etc. And also cry, decry uh, religious persecution every time they get in trouble for, uh, you know, what they do, which is espionage and treason, affecting operations of warfare against other people. Uh, having concerns about the text, the FBI concluded that it could not be regulated as it was published through mass media. You know, it's nice when they make conclusions like that for their own things, and they don't make conclusions like that for everybody else's things, because as we all know today, they have no issue with, quote-unquote, regulating things that are published through mass media. Furthermore, the FBI ruled that the anarchist coup does not incite forcible resistance to any law of the United States, and is therefore protected under the First Amendment. Well, that's nice that they have the ability to rule that. While much of the text was deemed to be inaccurate, FBI concluded that the chapter on explosive appears to be accurate in most respects. This is conception. The FBI has kept records of the book, releasing the bulk of its investigation file in 2010. And, of course, naturally, the FBI would have, uh, or the FBI juridic entity, anyway, would have no concept of those things. But most of the people that apparently work for the FBI would have no concept of those things either, despite all their extensive training. They're the people who work there are basically just uh, liars, thieves, mostly paper pushers, and they get all the uh, low-level people to do their dirty work, essentially be the um, guys that kick in the doors, you know, being the local police and the gangs, and street gangs and stuff like that, you know. They're not going to do it themselves. They're far too above that type of thing. They'll get other people to do it, and then they'll, you know, give out nice little FBI jackets and stuff like that. Because that's how they, they their, their games are all about perception, right? It's all about perception. Con. The Anarchist Collective Crime, Crimeth Incorporated. That's all one word. Looks like Crime Think, but anyway. Which published the book Recipes for Disaster, an Anarchist Cookbook in response, denounces the earlier book saying it was not composed to release by anarchists, not derived from anarchist practice, not intended to promote freedom and autonomy or challenge repressive power, was barely a cookbook, as most of the recipes in it are notoriously unreliable. So there's your one comment in this entire section about how crappy this uh, piece of literature actually is. That's because it's entirely a creation for propagandistic purposes, and it's a good, ex probably the most famous example on this list anyway, of false ban. It's probably Notable incidents of alleged possession. And here you go. This is the same game that they always play, where whenever there's an event, usually, especially their false flag events, they always link the, uh, one of their uh, phony creations to the uh, event so that they can label and character caricaturize the individual as if the simple possession of something is uh, well to them it is in fact a crime it is not a legitimate crime though because they're the legitimate criminals or I suppose uh, yeah they're legitimate criminals because they're you know violating legitimate laws uh, <clears throat> with their phony illegitimate ones 1973, two bombings of military recruitment centers in Portland, Oregon. U.S. by anti-war activists is a conspiracy which included academic and bookseller Frank Stern's geese following it, which is claimed to court that the Annex cookbook was part of the group's library. Isn't that nice? Our book is part of their library. Yay, they got it. 
Yeah, sure. 1976. Police linked the bombing of Grand Central Terminal and hijacking of a TWA flight to Croatian radicals used instructions from the anarchist cookbook. 1981. The anarchist cookbook was linked to Puerto Rican rebels who bombed an FBI headquarters using the book's directions. Thomas Spinks also referred to the text during the bombing of 10 abortion clinics in the United States. So, and those three ones, first of course, they're trying to inculcate or uh, create a pretext for protection and uh, essentially um, perception, protection through perception of abortion clinics and FBI headquarters, making you think, oh, okay, well, they're going to bolster protection because they were just attacked, allegedly. And now you can't talk about them at all because they've had a tragic circumstance that affected them. And if you talk about it, it's very insensitive. So these are, of course, as we all know, methods in, to uh, inoculate, <laughs> if you will. There are particular elements against ridicule, investigation, um, to, to make sure that anything talking about all their crimes are washed away by the nasty and horrible event that apparently just happened to them. And actually also an excuse to increase funding so that they can, you know, have more thugs and do more of their nasty stuff that they do. Um, of course, the effort with the airlines in the second example here, that would naturally be for the uh, imp um, imposition of the TSA and many other things that they have uh, had to work up to anyway as far as their uh, criminal occupation goes. And then for military recruitment centers uh, that likely had to do of course, that would have had to do something with the draft crimes, things like that, uh, in 1973. <clears throat> the Canadian government permitted the book to be imported from the United States, 2002. Canada Customs and Revenue Agency concluded that book does not violate either hate or obscenity laws. These are, of course, illegitimate laws. Therefore, the previous ban on the text was resolved. So that's your fake ban. 2005, the London public transport bombers were linked to the book, naturally. 2007, a 17-year-old was arrested in the United Kingdom and faced charges under anti-terrorism law in the UK for possession of the anarchist cookbook. He was cleared of all charges in October 2008 after arguing that he was a prankster who just wanted to research fireworks and smoke bombs. And there's another fictional person. Of course, probably all of these events are fictional, and the individuals involved are probably all of the fictional. Most of the real stuff you never hear about, and anything that they really have a problem with gets completely suppressed, like most of my work. And there's all kinds of nasty things done to it. You have uh, fake uh, works that you never made, inscribed in your name. You have, uh, you know, uh, uh, paperwork that won't get processed by people. You have... Uh, funds that get stolen and you get all kicked out of things license pulled right they do all this nasty stuff to somebody who does something they actually don't want and so whenever you see something propagated it's because pretty much they're doing it right because that's how they control things through uh, extortion espionage treason terrorism of course you know to use one of their words um <clears throat> and so when it comes to their stuff they you know create mystery around it by pretending to ban it. 2010 in County Durham, UK, Ian Davidson Davison and his son were imprisoned under anti-terrorism laws for the manufacturing of rice and their possession of the anarchist book along with its availability was noted by the authorities. This led to a London judge and police campaign to have the book banned in the UK. And another fake ban. 2012, the anarchist cookbook was found to have been the possession of James Holmes, the perpetrator of the Aurora Theater shooting in Colorado, USA. Uh, we all know that the primary reason for that false flag. Give pretext to more gun control crap. 2013, and of course, uh, removal of protective equipment like body armor and uh, uh, face protection and all that stuff, right, to, to protect people from attacks by their Gestapo, either street gangs, police, um, sheriffs, state troopers, any of their occupational forces. 
2013, renewed calls were made in the United States to ban the book, citing links to a school shooting in Arapahoe, Colorado, and 2013 Santa Monica shootings by Carl Pearson. 2015, U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein pushed to have the book removed from the online databases. And, of course, it's very easy when you control the narrative, when the event never really happened and it's completely fictional, so there's no uh, anomalies, there's no uh, other variables to deal with. Well, in that case, you can control the entire perception around it because it never really happened and the people don't exist. Make whatever you want up, and everything will corroborate it because there's nothing in reality to deny it. And that's one of the main themes on how they do this false ban. Of course, a recent and famous false ban would be the Dr. Seuss books. Dr. Seuss is notoriously one of their people, right? A doctor who wrote children's books that teach children to um, uh, separate from family, to become easier to manipulate and control, and of course, naturally, all of his books are paraded around schools for this and that. So why would they want to fake ban Dr. Seuss books? Well, to raise revenue, as always. A lot of these fake ban things <clears throat> have to do with raising revenue, but if you can, you know, knock out two birds with one stone, as the saying goes, well then, why not have multiple reasons for something, which most of their uh, events, most of their tactics, most of what they do, and we know who they are, and if you don't, then, you know, i got a bunch of videos talking about who they are. Well, <clears throat> they will also benefit from people's looking into and reading their stuff and being led down um, deception and uh, have, create a greater chance that their cons will be successful. And many other things, basically just... Uh, to quote the line from uh, the Cardinal Principles for the citizenship director, the job is to direct thinking to the issues of the day. Now, perhaps a less well-known uh, false ban, as far as I've come across, would be the cult role-playing game. Um, cult with K-U-L-T, switch for cult. Also, it should be noticed that cult, C-U-L-T, not sure about K-U-L-T, is the prefix for the word culture. So that's interesting. Anyway, <clears throat> it's a contemporary horror role-play game originally created by Unia Jonsson and Michael Peterson. With illustrations by Niels... Gulikson, first published in Sweden by Aventyrspel, later Target Games in 1991, Cult is notable for its philosophical and religious depth, as well as for its mature and controversial content. First English edition was published in 1993 by Metropolis LTB. 1995, 7M Circle translated the second Swedish edition into French. In 2018, current licensor Holmgast released the fourth edition called Cult Divinity Laws, created by Robin Luchenberg and Peter Nalo. The edition moved the setting from the then current 1990s to the new current 2010s and was completely rewritten with new art, layout, and rule set based on Powered by the Apocalypse. The new edition was well received by critics and fans and won two Annie's. I don't know what Ennies are. For Best Writing and Best Cover 2019, it was also nominated for Best Interior Art. Now, I'll note that it actually appears that this book was not written originally in Sweden, or published, but rather in French. And that could be many places. There's many places that speak French. So that's probably a lie from the outset. And the individuals apparently involved in development are also fictional characters. And it's, um, you know, a pseudonym. So, published behind a wall of a facade. Now, the second thing about it is that uh, where it relates to philosophical and religious depth. That's the first note that tells you that this book was written by, one, either Jesuits, 
but more than likely simply low level or lower level anyway uh, Roman Catholics who are involved in uh, secret sex because as far as I'm aware the Jesuits don't usually do more than just maybe revision here and there and then they try to get other people to do the dirty work as it were because they're above all that right higher they are the more lazy they are the less they want to engage in any sort of actual work right so this this work originally I thought might have been legitimate considering all of the efforts to revise and continuously publish new spin-offs and other things to obfuscate what the uh, original things teaching however after I read it myself I discovered it was nothing but a, another example of a fake ban. And here's the fake ban tactic under controversy similar to the moral panic of Dungeons and Dragons in the United States in the 1980s, cult figured in Swedish controversies in the 1990s. At the time of the game's initial publication, role-playing games in Sweden were still sold primarily through toy stores rather than bookstores or specialized hobby shops. Now, like I said, this thing is coming from France, and it's more of the internationalist tactic to implement foreign operations from one place to another where everything is foreign and everything is international so you have zero domestic anything anywhere on the entire globe cult was noted by the general press several times during the decade after its initial publication and in 1997 the cult core rules were quoted in a motion in the parliament of sweden the motion was to stop taxpayer funding of youth groups that were active with role -playing. and there of course you get your real target role-playing games. Just like with the Anarchist Cookbook and with all this other nonsense, they promote and publish some nonsense and then use it as an excuse to cudgel the real motive, the real object, which is to remove something they don't like, something that's a problem for their control structure. It refers to the Buv murder where a 15-year-old in a small town in southern Sweden called Buv was killed by two 16- and 17-year-old friends who, according to the legal motion, were influenced by cult. Yeah. Nobody would be influenced by that, that crappy game. It's, it's incredibly just juvenile, even though those are juveniles. No, it's, um, this is a false ban. Writer Didi Ornstedt and painter Bjorn Stjolstedt wrote a book, De Overnes Arme, Army of the Abandoned, where they warned against the role-playing game hobby with a particular focus on the game cult. The title refers to children supposedly ignored by their parents and therefore susceptible to projected radicalization of RPGs. This, a lot of this stuff, of course, naturally is being run behind many facades, but mainly out of churches and secret sects which their entire job is to control people like flocks of sheep it's naturally remove anything that might be a problem so it's not really about rpgs only specific ones not this one mind you but other ones that they won't even mention that they won't that they will create all kinds of excuses to go after their true objects of this operation. Critics of role-playing games have attempted to tie cult to a 16-year-old Swedish boy who committed suicide by shotgun in November 1996. Probably never happened. Local newspaper Tonsberg's Blood in Tonsberg, Norway, similarly used cult in relation to the disappearance of a boy called Andreas Hammer, July 1st, 1994. Andreas Hammer allegedly played cult the week prior to his disappearance. He's still missing. Yeah, that's because he doesn't exist. Never did. This is all part of the false ban tactic, which isn't just to sell or promote the actual thing, but it's also to create an air of legitimacy to an otherwise illegitimate and criminal enterprise that half of, on behalf of foreign enemies, but becoming harder and harder for them to hide, and they are becoming more and more transparent especially the more aware you are the more you see it so here's the cover that classically uh, well uh, morbid uh, i'm not sure what the right word for it is but really lame picture of a angel you know uh 
semi-nude with white feather wings and things like that. Cult Death is Only the Beginning on the Borderline Between Terror and Madness, Dreams of Death. So yeah, this thing is just way over the top. Not very not very well made, completely full of tropes and other crap, and, and this wouldn't work on quote-unquote radicalizing anyone, but that's not really their motive here. It is to radicalize people, but it's more to radicalize people who are ignorant to think that they're going on some sort of, you know, crusade against something evil. Mainly your Karens and, and the little rumor uh, queens and the church system, which cause a lot more damage with their uh, whisperings than they realize, generally. But they might. They might realize the actual damage that they do. Uh, and then, of course, there's other elements, too. People who think that they're, um, you know, to go around and attack somebody who's legitimately doing something uh, out of the idea that they themselves are the hero and that person's a villain. Such as, of course, an easy example would be a father going to get his child from a uh, creepy school system and then is blocked by police or some other occupying force. Uh, and those people think that they're stopping an active shooter or something like that, right? So this, is, uh, this book is terrible. And the cover shows that. Now, the first part in this book that shows you the nature of the writers and publishers is under the section Illuminati. There are several societies for people who sense that we are prisoners and can regain our divinity through illumination. Not what the illumination for Illuminati means, though. They operate extremely secretly and are always hunted by lictors and death angels. Cults of the sort are exterminated every now and then, whenever archons or lictors learn of their existence. In the late 20th century, several Illuminati cults have begun to act almost openly within the New Age movement. They are held together by a loose net of contacts and many dummy movements, which hide the few groups of Illuminati. The members are often spread all over the world and meet secretly at peace conferences, healing sessions, and shamanist festivals. Now that's a strangely positive lean towards the Illuminati. Whereas nowadays you'll find mostly only a bad lean towards them in perspective. Mostly because, of course, they're a group of people who are arrogant, self-aggrandizing, uh, pretty much idiots, who are going around doing nasty things to nasty to people, not to nasty people, but to people in general, to keep them ignorant, to keep them docile, to uh, keep them useful for exploitation. And, of course, naturally, the people doing it don't realize that they are, in fact, playing into their own destruction as well. But that's not what this book was written about or by... Uh, that level of awareness was written by people attempting to uh, do these nasty things. And it was clearly written by somebody who thinks themselves, anyway, in Illuminati. So in the introduction, it states, This is a world of twisting corridors in the maze of the great city where street peddlers sell demons in bottles for a stay louder. And there's a name drop. And secret words are spoken over sweating bourbon glasses in rundown bars. Forgotten gods, that's using gods in the term of the way it's normally used and not in the term of the way it's supposed to be used, which is good. So that would be uh, forgotten goods, which doesn't sound exactly right. And revived by the new neon lights and the street noise. Now there's also that stupid TV show called Neon Gods, so go figure. Their patterns of nonsense repeat everywhere. And tread their dance of death in trendy clubs. Every doorway, every rickety staircase down to the subterranean levels can be entrance to hell. This sounds like it was written by one of those uh, video games cause violence, morons. It's so tropey and awful. This book is. Secret societies meet in elegant conference centers to plot and reach for the powers they have glimpsed in the shadows beyond. Condemned men hunt for the secret of immortality. Discreet organizations waste, uh, waste unfathomable fortunes on deciphering characters carved by madmen on walls and subways. The witch masters of our time seek the paths to power and riches in their own dark souls they all crave for hegemony, searching for cues to solve the riddles that they see in the diversity of our reality. 
Of course, it should be noticed that two overlapping keys are on the flag of the Vatican, but those mean something else. They aren't real physical keys, probably, anyway. And naturally, uh, most of this stuff has some half-truths in it, so when you read it, you're like, yeah, yeah, that's true, right? And then, of course, you get let off into some nonsense thinking, all uh, beyond your comprehension and uh, inexplainable magic, even though magic is the another word for knowledge. But nothing is what it seems to be. Only a handful of the many facets of reality are accessible accessible to our senses. The world we see around us is an illusion created by our imagination to stave off madness. No, it's not an illusion created by our imagination. It's an illusion created by uh, people who consider themselves shepherds of the flock, who really just use abuse and criminal acts and uh, operations of um, poisoning and other things to uh, create the illusion. Those who fancy themselves masters of the invisible forces will be cruelly disappointed when their illusions crumble and the demons arrive to collect their worshippers. And of course, that's using worshipper, not in the sense of somebody who watches and studies, which is what it should be, but in the nonsensical sense that is, is propagated by the churches. In the borderland between darkness and madness, dreams and death, there is a reality beyond the senses. Dreams and illusions can shape matter, or can twist bodies and bring insanity out into the physical reality. The barrier between the outer and the inner is an illusion. Oh, oh, oh. yes, horror. Be afraid. Not long ago, there was a creator god. There was a creator god. Right. And a firm order of nature, but God has abandoned his children and disappeared out into the darkness. Perhaps dead, perhaps in exile, lost angels and demons, but a weak members of a high power, a higher power, a force of order that once ruled their lives, but gradually they forgot. Now, of course, what this is referring to is not the, uh, the creator God that many might think of, but instead is referring to the supreme being, or as it says, a creator god, which uh, relates to the juridical entity, the super being entity that they are still attempting to recreate, and did in fact once exist, but was dismantled, as relates to the ziggurats. The boundaries of reality have been weakened, decreasing numbers of people are breaking through the barriers and countering the chaos that lies on the other side. Heaven and hell do not have the same meaning for every man. Each creates his own purgatory. Dreams and madness lead further and further out in the dark away from what is familiar and reasonable. Oh, this is just terrible. The prince of darkness wanders far, seeking God. The only being who can justify his existence and give it meaning, heavens and hells have broken open or being abandoned, demons and angels roam homeless on earth and look for the worshippers they need for their own survival in a world without a god. In the cities where all truths are equal, they forgot the old boundaries between evil and good. Ugh. Old gods linger powerless and bewildered in the slums, and I'm just not going to bother reading any more of this garbage. Basically, this is a fabrication of somebody with very little skill, who just pieces together a bunch of tropes and other endlessly, um, endlessly uh, uh, the dead beaten horse of, of uh, fantas fantastical morbidity which is impossible to relate to because it's it's not it's it's just it's really terrible and this of course is their entity of false ban that they use to target role playing games other role playing games of course not their nonsensical crappy ones just like they uh, use books and other things as an excuse to um, censor and remove anything of true scale from from authorship whether it's movies, videos, and YouTube, doesn't matter. They always have their own little things they do as an excuse to go after things they don't want out there, just like they will go into markets and stuff and sell drugs and other items that probably most people don't want uh, as an excuse, to, of course, to shut it down. Now, I'm not saying that drugs are necessary inherently... Uh, well, I don't really want to get into that, but drugs, yes, are inherently bad, at least as far as their chemically toxic ones. But their real target, of course, usually are the plants, which uh, are not 
anywhere close to as damaging as the crap they invent. So, to um, read uh, one last part. It states, the world of cult is founded in modern Western thought, formed by 2,000 years of civilization, based on Christian ideas. And there it sounds like it was written by a religious nutbag from the Jesuit order, where all things religious are supreme law, and you're not allowed to question any of it, right? It was formed by 2,000 years of civilization, based on Christian ideas. That's how you would probably read it, because that's how they are, very contemptuous and, and just really lame people. Good and evil really do exist in a cosmic sense. There are angels and demons and an absent God who abandoned his children in the terrors of war. In man, there's a desire to wreck and do evil, but there is also light that can drive away the darkness. Ugh. So poorly written. Call can be used to recreate the atmosphere from horror movies like Nightmare on Elm Street or Hellraiser as horror with undead and monsters, creatures, or psychological horror like Twin Peaks. So there you got three movies that are being promoted here. Horror movies, right? Ugh. The only reason why those things actually terrify or horror people are for two reasons. One, most people are... Uh, inculcated or they are um, guarded against any sort of outside association. So they don't know any better, pretty much. Then also, their mental capacities are diminished through the in imposition of chemicals like fluorine in the water supply in the air and other things like that, which hamper um, cognitive processing. And so, this book is all full of labels and all kinds of things designed to target uh, that which they don't like. Then we can go to their interesting section on lodges. And the last part of this is important to notice. It states that lodge, the lodges is the common name for more discreet, for the more discreet of the Satanist cults. Yeah, that sounds like they've got a particular affinity to lodges in here. Their activities encompass black magic, power intrigues, and espionage for the legions of the damned. Certain lodges control companies which act as covers for drug dealing and arms smuggling. And there's, of course, part of your truth right there. Others are covers for more legitimate business activities which Astaroth wants to control. More like others are covers for more illegitimate business activities like money laundering because that's probably the most common of all all their non-profits and other nonsense the members of the lodges are seldom fanatic adherents to any cause rather their purposes are egoistic they seek personal power and wealth which they believe they can get by serving astaroth they are aware of that they work for the prince of darkness and their ideology is more developed than that of the hellers many lodge members are magicians and the primitive cult of violence that the hellers have hardly exists here each lodge has 10 to 300 members sometimes divided in smaller cells the lodge is led by Thanath Yerk, who answers to a demogorgon. Each demogorgon is responsible for a large area, usually whole country. The different lodges know very little about each other. There are 100 to 150 demogorgons spread over the world. They are powerful magicians. Razides, Nephrites, or incarnated death angels. They are ultimately responsible for Astaroth himself. Jargony, name dropping, right. The classic example of somebody with no skill. Most members of the lodges are respected, well-to-do citizens. The lodges don't accept members which are of no use to them. They have great resources. The lodge can send its members anywhere in the world, get a hold of hitmen and forces who deal with their enemies and manipulate the legal machinery to get their enemies accused of serious crimes. Contacts among police and lawyers give them power to manufacture evidence, bribe or intimidate juries, thus controlling trials. If the lodge is seriously threatened, it can appeal to the demigorgon for help if the demigorgon intercedes. Even more impressive resources are put at their disposal, including military powers. That paragraph actually seems to be relatively true. The lodges exist all over the world, but most of all in the West, and to some extent in Southeast Asia. In Africa and Northern Asia, there are few. They are also had little success in the Arab world. 
and I doubt that. Lodges are often disguised as harmless secret societies, exclusive yacht clubs, or country clubs. Some of them have corporations or even government agencies as cover. Their activities are performed in modern offices with administrative personnel, real bookkeeping, etc. That also seems true, especially considering the Rotary Club activities and the uh, conspiracies between attorneys that I've done videos on. Lodge members recognize each other by secret handshakes and signs, and that's probably not true. They never wear any visual marks, that's also not true. The lodges prefer behind-the-scenes work and subtle methods to achieve their goals. Well, that might be true, but they're not actually very good at that. They only report to violence in extreme circumstances, resort to violence in extreme circumstances, and never in such a way that they can trace to them, and that's not true. They resort to violence all the time, and usually that's their first go go to if they in fact have the resources to affect it. Most often they buy the services of hellers and other violent gangs to do their dirty work. The lodges have close contacts with non-human beings. Many members are death magicians, nephrites, and razites regularly attend meetings and incarnates of death angels supervise the activities. The lodges can summon creatures from inferno to frighten their opponents. And of course what they're talking about right there are juridical entities which are not actually not that impressive if we think about it. It's what we would refer to as corporations or in body form, incorporated, put into body. Corp, of course, being French for body, or cool. All activities of the lodges are kept very secret. Intricate security arrangements guarantee that no comprising facts, compromising facts can be revealed about the lodge's work. And they didn't do a very good job at that. With their vast financial and political resources, they are able to extract their members from almost any danger, like oily snakes they slither out of the tightest legal traps. Well, that's, of course, because we have a phony uh, criminal justice, so-called system. Lodges, it is a criminal justice system, right? The justice is criminal justice. It's not legitimate justice, it's justice that's criminal. <laughs> so in a word game, it's like the International Criminal Court. Court is criminal itself. Lodges have connections, or the International Criminal Police. Lodges have connections with Hellers, who they use for simple tasks in the legions of the damned who they cooperate with. They also have contacts with other power groups and occult societies. The Archons are struggling to infiltrate and crush the Lodges through their own agents. The Catholic Church has spent much time at work to expose the Lodges and their branches and to destroy them. And so there you get your single note that tells you the nature of the either singular writer or the revisionist behind this piece of crap publication. So they're either, most likely there's a Jesuit involved somewhere, and of course naturally they get other lower level minions to do their work, usually extorting those people out of the promise of future wealth and power, because that's how they usually operate, but in fact is just more enslavement mechanism, and they equally are enslaved to it as they try to do to others. Next, we're going to look at a description, surprisingly accurate, of Malkuth, but that name we should, uh, we will see in a minute, is a uh, different version of a different name. <clears throat> of a different entity. Also, it should be noted that in this book, despite the fact that it's a role-playing game, it shows nothing but a contempt for individuals, specifically, and humans. This is something we see uh, throughout their structure, and I saw most apparently in the school, the university system, they absolutely despise humans, and especially individuals. They teach 100% across the board that humans are incapable, weak, and easily, um, you know, sinners, right? That repeated crap, uh, mental, uh, psychological operation for churches. We're all poor sinners, born in incest, blah, 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 right? And, um, and of course, the other one is despised for uh, uh, completely... Uh, despising individuals. They say culture belongs to a group, not the individual that represents that culture. And that was in the university system that I read that. So this book, just like all their other works, contains contempt for individuals and humans. Which is very odd, because in most role-playing games, it's an elevation of the individual. Which is with Lord of the Rings, right? The individuals are going of their own volition to do something that nobody else can do. 
an elevation of the individual for adventure. Role-playing games do that as well. So it's really interesting to have a role-playing game that degrades individuals and specifically humans. So in one section, it states, Malkuth is a the rebel among the Archons. Under the Demiurge, she was the Archon closest to humanity. It was she who once made our world as a prison. All of our reality is, in a way, a manifestation of her. She shaped out of her own being in ancient times. She was worshipped as Mother Earth or the Great Mother, the Living Nature. She had several incarnates in our world. So here it's using something that's allegorical and making it literal, which is something they always do, right? Above, As above, so below, right? That's that crap that they like to repeat all the time. That basically just means that if it's literal, make it allegorical. It's allegorical, make it literal. Opposites are, uh, you know, doublespeak, right? They say one thing, but mean something else. That is what that means. When the Demiurge disappeared, Malkuth abandoned the power struggles of the other Archons and sought to aid humanity instead. For the last 200 years, she has supported the growth of cities and technology. Well, of course that's true if it's the Earth, right? Because where do cities and technology grow from the Earth? So, yeah. She wants to make it possible for people to awake and learn the truth. That part doesn't make any sense. It's just the Earth. Well, yeah, I don't really want to get into that. She protects sorcerers and helps them find real magic instead of the lies that have previously been spread by various cults. And, of course, here we're getting off into the nonsense because it's just the planet Earth. Or at least nature, anyway. The word, this is a characterization, anyway, of nature. This is pitted against Astaroth and nearly all the other Archons. Netzak is working frantically to thwart her plan. Baku's servants are rarely lictors. She prefers to use humans whom she attracts by offering them knowledge. Of course, there's no reference to animals, which is odd. Power and ultimately enlightenment and divinity. She has initiated dubious scientific experiments. She works to soften legislation so that genetic manipulation and medical technology can be de developed freely. And now we're getting into the nonsense again. She supports the explosive growth of cities because this creates those violent and crumbling environments where people can awaken from captivity. Now that's entirely not true, but in the context of this entity being the Earth, a lot of this stuff is what you would call a half-truth. Part of the uh, tactic of selling a lie. Of course, if you use this tactic so often and all your things are half-truths, and somebody's reading it for that, it becomes very obvious. Now, <clears throat> the last note on this entity they call Malkuth. In Germany, her human servant, Vibeke Nachtal, or Nachtal, it's a group of successful medical research institutes which bounce on the edge of what is legal and ethically conceivable. The Knoxdal Institute on the Polish border works on methods to affect large numbers of people with genetics. Her experimental mutants with modified genes have been manufactured. She has secretly devised several radioactive leaks and chemical disasters as part of her attempts to affect the whole population. Rebecca is a woman of about 45 years. She has short blonde hair and gray cold eyes. She gives an impersonal chilly expression. Impression. This, of course, is an overselling of their capabilities, as they like to do all the time. They don't actually have the abilities to do a lot of these things. Most of the stuff they have is simply just petty crimes and stuff that's really not that impressive. So, <clears throat> in the Wikipedia article on the Sephirot in the Kabbalah, Malkuth means kingdom. Makes you wonder if kingdom is another word for Earth. It is associated with the realm of matter slash earth and relates to the physical world, planets, and the solar system. It is important not to think of the Sephirah as unspiritual. Even though Malkuth is the emanation furthest from the divine source, furthest from the divine source. First of all, divine means to guess. Adivinar in Spanish is to guess. And to be furthest from the guessing source is, in quotation marks, considered to be a bad thing. That's because life 
is uh, inimical to the creepy creatures that they create called corporations and their strange desire to uh, cull the human herd, as it were. It is still in the tree of life and therefore has its own unique spiritual quality. It is often said that the, that Kether, the highest Sephirah, is in Malkuth, and Malkuth is in Kether, as a receiving sphere of all the other Sephiroth. Malkuth gives tangible form to the other emanations. The divine energy comes down and finds its expression in its plane, and our purpose as human beings is to bring that energy back around the circuit again and back up the tree. Our purpose as human beings. So, first of all, the writer is dictating what the purpose is to all human beings. And stating that um, Malkuth, or the kingdom, also the earth, or matter, is the furthest from the divine source. So that, of course, tells you what the perspective of the writer is here, which is the same perspective of the writer of that piece of garbage we read, which is the same perspective of the writer that wrote the Anarchist Cookbook. So... Malkuth, Malkuth sounds quite similar to Melkart, and it's changed just enough that they would be able to say that it's really not the same thing. Uh, Melkart, pro properly Phoenician, Milkkart, king of the city. Less accurately, Melkart, Melkarth, or Melgart. So some things to notice here with this name is we also have Meatgart, which is Middle Earth, or just another name for the Earth. Of course, there being a lower Earth and an upper Earth. And then we live in Middle Earth. Midgard is from Lord of the Rings. You also have milk and art. All right, like art thou. So this might not actually be referring to the Earth, but rather the water or the milk of the earth. Art could be earth. On the other hand, it could also be art milk, and it might have something to do with skin color. So there's a bunch of different possibilities here. Either way, Malkuth sounds quite similar to Milkart or Midgart, as I would say, is the more logical possibility here. Okay, did Milkart too? Was tutelary god of the Phoenician city of Tyre. Of course, as Eshmoon protected Sidon. This was written from the same perspective as everything else. Titulary God. How can you have a titulary good? That's that's a question, and then not to mention titulary, as if the title is the important part. Ugh, stuff's stupid. Milkhart was often titled, right? So they have titulary, and now they say titled. Baal Sir, Lord of Tyre. Baal is written with one A instead of two, and they do like to say that Baal means Lord or Master, which means it probably doesn't, considering they pretty much always uh, always lie, right? The ancestral king of the royal line in Greek by Interpretatio Greca, he was identified with Heracles and referred to as the Tyrian Heracles. Melkart was venerated in Phoenician and Punic cultures from Syria to Spain, allegedly. First occurrence of the name is in 9th century BCE, Stella inscription found in 939 north of Aleppo in northern Syria. The Ben Hadad inscription erected by the son of King of Arma for his lord Melkart, which he vowed to him and he heard his voice. So, yes, they could easily be talking about the sea or they could be talking about earth. It's hard to say. But either way, Malkuth and Melkart appear to be similar in not just character, but also in the makeup of their um, syllable, the name, the rhythm to the speech, as it were. Now we also have Milk Tart, Afrikaans for Milk Tart. So there you get an example of where milk is milk. It probably comes from Dutch, right? Where it says, a South African dessert originally created by the Dutch settlers in the Cape. So milk is milk, and milk is milk. Milk, of course, having the change of the E to the I, as apparently happened with Amen, coming from Amin. This is a very common change of E's to I's and I's to E's. 
So that's that's pretty obvious there. Now, also with their word games, we have the word ball as listed before, but that was just B-A-L. So it would be A-A-L. It's all kinds of ways you can spell things, and of course, naturally, they are liars, and they always say that things are not the same, and blah, blah, blah. But you have a place called Ball Back. It's a city located east of the Litani River in Lebanon's Becca Valley, about 67 kilometers northeast of Beirut. It is the capital of Baalbek Hermel Governate. Governate. Hermes Hermel, right? Baalbek, Baal Sobek. Most likely. And of course, naturally, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site because obviously the location has to be controlled so that nothing could uh, upset the balance of their control over the sheep people. And apparently, after Alexander the Great conquered the city in 334 BCE, which likely uh, happened in some other context, as Alexander the Great possibly wasn't a real person, who knows, considering the way they lie about everything. He renamed it Hel Heliopolis, or, or Sun City. Helio being Sun. Of course, we should notice that Helio... The first three letters make hell. And hell is known in quote-unquote Christian tradition to be a place of fire and brimstone, right? That thing from Sodom and Gomorrah is where they get their uh, Bible thing in hell versus Hades, the underground underworld. In the Critical Role Campaign 3, premiered on October 21st, 2021, it mentions the name Marquette, and it states that in uh, the campaign is an actual play which follows the Bell's Hells, a party of adventurers in their travels across the continent of Marquette. So here we've got a continent named Marquette. Sounds quite a lot like Melkart or Malkuth, and all these words are referring to Earth, and. Apparently, what these people want to do is to create what they call hell on earth or their desire for global warming to turn earth into hell, a place of fire and brimstone. Go figure. These are real th tangible things that they're trying to do, uh, just like the Jesuits say, go set the world on fire. So naturally in the book you have a group called the Hellers, States the Hellers are the lowest form of Satanist cults. Their purposes are to get as much power and money as possible, live in luxury, and be able to tread on others with impunity. Their philosophy is simple. Strength is might, and might is right. They despise weakness and believe that there should be no other power than that which rests on physical strength and the ability to forcibly subdue others. Hellers are small groups of Astaroth worshippers among outsiders and bums. Each cult has between 10 to 100 members. The cults are gangs governed by a leader. There is frequent exchange of members between the groups. In spite of the vague structure, there are some who may be called leaders of the Western European Hellers. Rainier Hartmut, a police commissioner in Berlin, has a strong influence over the gangs, and so does the car and drug dealer Vincent von der Dom in Rotterdam. And of course, here you're getting more of the perspective that you find throughout the book, which is French. Not Swedish. In the U.S., a man in his 20s who calls himself Iceman controls several gangs in the Los Angeles area, and a boy genius said to be only 16 controls most of the youth crime in New York. He is known as Elroy. Hellers must consist of men between 15 and 35 years of age. The fixation on physical strength makes it hard for women and older men to assert themselves in the gangs. And, of course, this is written by somebody who's an idiot as well. The gangs have access to automatic weapons and advanced modern explosives. Automatic weapons and advanced modern explosives. I guess they aren't very familiar with what our so-called military grade really means. Many have close links with the military. Yep, there you go. Yep, just um, diminish the military right there. The, the military are all a bunch of thugs and morons. <clears throat> they like to say that all the time. When in fact, that's who they are. So it's a projection. When in fact, people in the military have mostly anyway, are taught a code of conduct. I mean, a real code of conduct, not a phony code of conduct that's only designed to control people as 
uh, minions, even though there were a lot of individuals in the military that, with that perspective, that, you know, you're there to do what you're told and nothing else. But officials never want to admit their contacts with the Hellers, so they find it hard to exert influence through official channels. Drug and arms dealing contribute to a good economy in many groups. Heller exists, Hellers exist all over Europe and the Middle East, North Africa, and America. They are scattered cults in Japan and Southeast Asia and China and Black Africa. They are rare. In China and Black Africa, they are rare. Yeah, more of the perspective of the person that wrote this. <clears throat> Many Hellers are constantly traveling, running from authorities and murder charges. Their net of contacts help them hide from the police. They hide out in abandoned houses in the outskirts of the cities or in provisional camps out in the countryside. They dress like many other violent gangs, and may be difficult to tell apart from neo-Nazis and motorcycle gangs. Neo-Nazis. New Nazis. Whatever the hell that means. Because we have old Nazis or national socialists here who are, you know, ran the MK Ultra program and other things like that with the uh, back end CIA, etc. Black leather, plastic, and old blue jeans decorated with chains, rivets, and symbols. The German Iron Cross is a common emblem as is a swastika. Real Hellers know each other by secret handshakes and code words. That's probably, all of that's a lie. Designed to obfuscate and label and, of course, naturally diminish and target things they don't like. Hellers are violent. They never use subtle methods, but prefer violence and terror. They never shrink from getting in trouble with the law, and they are not intimidated by risk of revenge from their enemies. Cowardice is the ultimate shame for Heller. Never shrink from getting in trouble with the law. Which law is that? And more of the perspective of the writer. Some of these cults have connections to creatures beyond the illusions. Legionaries from Asteros legions are spread out here and there in the gangs. Occasionally, a nephrite or Razid has joined a gang to help them perform a robbery or an assault. There was much talk about a case a few years ago when a gang of hellers in Belgium captured some police officers and tortured them to death. Actually, the work of a couple of nephrites. Ugh. And this, of course, is mostly garbage. Hellers do not deny their existence in public, but they don't advertise. They prefer to do their business under the cover of darkness. Their cults have close links with neo-Nazis. So there we get that word repeated twice. They're using repetition. Racists, fascists, fascists, fascists and some other anarchic groups. Some other anarchic groups. Fascists are anarchic now. Ugh. It's just these labels that people use, and they just drop them, and they don't have any concept or understanding of where they come from. They also have contacts with Atheros legions and with some tittier Satanist groups. The most persistent enemies of the Hellers are actually the Mafia. Whatever the hell that means. The Mafia means family, by the way. Of course, they're probably talking about the criminal syndicate of the Mafia, which that wouldn't make any sense, that they would be persistent enemies. One effect of this is that Hellers are rare in Italy and southern France. The Mafia has contacts in the Catholic Church and organizations which are controlled by lictors. Yeah. All of these view the Hellers as a threat and abomination. Muslim fundamentalists in northern Africa have attempted to exterminate Hellers there. Of course, another possibility is that this book was revised and originally most of it said something different. But who knows? So we have the American Hellenic Educational Progressive Association, AHEPA, usually referred to as the Order of Ahepa. It is a fraternal organization founded on July 26, 1922 in Atlanta, Georgia. Ahepa was founded with focus on civil rights, particularly to counteract the Ku Klux Klan. Name dropping, of course, and um, emotional association. That's what we get in that line. Classic tactic of a con man. It is the largest and oldest grassroots association of American citizens of Greek heritage and Philhellens, with more than 400 chapters across the United States, Canada, Australia, and Europe. The mission of AHEPA is to promote the ancient Hellenic ideas of education, philanthropy, civic responsibility, family, and individual excellence through community service and volunteerism. So basically, their idea is to, through philanthropy, education, civic responsibility, family, and individual excellence through community service and volunteerism, create hell on earth. Or essentially, go set the world on fire, as the Jesuits said. History. The AHEPA was founded as a fraternity in Atlanta, Georgia, on July 26, 1922. Its initial mission was to promote the image of Greeks in America, assist them with citizenship, and assimilate into American culture and combat prejudice. Ugh. 
This, of course, was written by somebody recently. During that inaugural meeting, it was decided that AHEPA's purposes would be A, to advance and promote pure and undefiled Americanism among the Greeks of the United States, the territories, and colonial possessions. Kind of sounds like eugenics there, doesn't it? To educate the Greeks in the matter of democracy, so basically to lie about what democracy is, and in the matter of the government of the United States, right? Their social democracy from the cardinal principles, which states that social uh, the the individual is uh, so too formed or whatever i'm paraphrasing uh to benefit the society's whole and not himself right to be a minion a exploitable slave or worker to instill the deepest loyalty to the united states it's of course their united states their foreign interests their foreign subsidiary of the uh, minions in europe not, of course, the domestic constitution of the United States, to promote fraternal sociability to practice benevolent aid among this nationality. With full assimilation of Greek Americans, its mission evolved toward philanthropy, education, and promoting and preserving the Hellenic identity, so hell, of the Greek Americans and ethnic Greeks of other countries where HEPA is present, such as Australia, Canada, and Bahamas, as well as Greece and Cyprus. In recent years, the HEPA has also expanded to other countries in Europe besides Greece and Cyprus, including Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, and Netherlands, and the UK. Founders of the fraternity were eight men, all residents of Atlanta, who conceived the idea of the establishment of an association of mainly citizens of Greek descent, although not limited only to such members. The eight founders of the Order of HEPA, who were also the members of the first Supreme Lodge of the organization, that's a nice name for them, right? Were Nicholas D. Chotas. James Campbell, Spiro J. Stamos, Harry Anhelopoulos, George A. Polos, John Anhelopoulos, George Campbell, and James Vlass. Who knows if those people actually existed. Organization. Originally, a HEPA was organized on a lodge system like that of the Masons or Oddfellows. The Oddfellows, apparently, were part of the Masons. So stupid. Local units were called subordinate lodges, and state or territory structures were called superior lodges. Now local groups are called chapters, and regional organizations are called districts. Isn't that interesting? Wonder what, I wonder if that's where the District of Columbia came from, perhaps out of a superior lodge. <laughs> the national structure is called the Supreme Lodge, however, and all of its officers have supreme in their titles, such as Supreme President, Supreme Treasurer, etc., just like the Supreme High Chancellor of the United Nations, His Excellency. A. <laughs> the Order of AHEPA has over 400 chapters across the United States, Canada, and Europe. In addition, the chapters report to 28 different districts. These 28 districts report to the Supreme Lodge and headquarters located in Washington, D.C. Isn't that interesting? Membership originally membership was restricted to only Greeks. In his third meeting, the order decided to change this, allowing non-Greeks to join. In 1979, AHEPA had over 25,000 members and 400 chapters. By 1989, the number climbed to 60,000, despite an overall decline in memberships of fraternal groups during this period. There have been 540 chapters chartered in the United States, 16 chartered in Canada, 30 chartered in Greece, 5 chartered in Cyprus, and 10 chartered in Europe. There are sister chapters in HEPA. Australasia, Australia, and New Zealand, an estimated 500,000 men have been inducted into the Order of HEPA over its 90-year history. So one of the things that would be important to notice is the focus on the hells aspect. Considering the, the name would be Greek, so why is this organization not called a Greek organization, whereas it's called a Hellenic association? That's an interesting question right there. Supreme Convention. In accordance with the provisions of the HEPA Constitution, the Supreme Convention of the Order of a HEPA shall be the highest constituted body of the entire HEPA. It shall remain in session until it is adjourned by a majority of its members. Its power over the entire order shall be limited only by the HEPA Constitution and the HEPA bylaws, over which it shall have exclusive power to alter and shall consist in its composite whole the voting members of the Convention. Politics. A HEPA has taken its stand on the Cyprus issue since 1955 when it formed the Justice for Cyprus Committee to support Cyprus independence. What, of course, they mean there is the independence of the Cyprus trade against you from the human populace that live in the area. More of their doublespeak. Through the decades, the organization has continued to advocate on issues relating to Greece and Cyprus in Washington while also educating the public about these topics. 
congressional scorecard for each Congress. A hate bill complies with congressional scorecard on issue of reports to the American Hellenic community and to the organization. The purpose of the scorecard is to educate the HEPA's membership and the community on how engaged members of Congress are on these issues, or at least their level of awareness. More double speak. So this brings us to the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, of course known as the first Hells there. It's an international outlaw motorcycle club whose members typically ride Harley-Davidson motorcycles in the United States and Canada. The Hells Angels are incorporated as the Hells Angels Motorcycle Corporation. Common nicknames for the club are the HA, Red and White, HAMC, and 81. With a membership of over 6,467 chapters in 59 countries, the HAMC is the largest outlaw motorcycle club in the world. Of course, they mean outlaw differently there. Many departments and many police and international intelligence agencies, including the United States Department of Justice and Criminal Intelligence Service Canada, of course, that'd be the CIA, the Australian Federal Police, and the Europol consider the club an organized crime syndicate. Of course, it's one of their mechanisms or creatures. And they're all correlated together. History, the Hells Angels originated in March 7, 1948. Of course, it's going to be a backstory. In Fontana, California, when several small motorcycle clubs agreed to merge, Otto Fraidley, a World War II veteran, is credited with starting the club after breaking from the pissed-off Bastards Motorcycle Club over a feud with a rival gang. One has to wonder what that club's legitimacy actually was. According to an alternative theory, the Hells Angels were founded on November 5th, 1951 in San Bernardino by Dick White, a member of the Redlands Road Runners. Actually, you have conflicting stories because they're probably parallel organizations. According to the website, the club's name was suggested by Arvid Olson, an associate of the founders who had served in the Hells Angels squadron of the Flying Targers in China during World War II. In a letter written to the Guinness Book of World Records by a member of the Hells Angels' behalf. They love doing things on behalf of things. It is instead said that the club's name was taken from the Hells Angels' squadron of the 303 or 303rd Bombardment Group, which was active in the European theater of World War II. It is at least clear that the name was inspired by the tradition for World Wars I and II, whereby the Americans gave their squadron's fierce death-defying title. An example of this lies in one of the three P-50 squadrons of flying tigers fielded in Burma, China, which was dubbed Hell's Angel. In 1930, the Edward Howard Hughes film Hell's Angels showcased extraordinary and dangerous feats of aviation and is believed the World War II groups that use the name based it on the film. According to Hell's Angels website, they're aware that there's an apostrophe missing in Hell's, but it is you who miss it. We don't. That's an interesting note there. It is coming from a point of contempt for the reader and using that royal we there. Always from the perspective of we. Of course, naturally, this is another example of the false ban in which the Hells Angels are promoted through the efforts of the individual's fake attempts to shut them down. And all of this, of course, is fictional backstory. It all relates to the Hellenic organization or operation on behalf of the Jesuit mission as well, or at least in, con in coordination with, to create hell on earth or to bring Helios of the sun to the earth uh, in a land of fire and brimstone, essentially destroying all life through fire and chemicals. So, in that RPG book, uh, Cult, there are some elements that are similar to the Keys to the Kingdom by Garth Nix. However, the Keys to the Kingdom series speaks allegorically and tries to, uh, appears in any way, to accurately explain a lot of these concepts. There's a lot of things that are important here. For one, in the Keys to the Kingdom, the architect is a woman, similar to that Malkuth uh, architect person. They call Archon in the book. In addition, there is a lot of reference to keys, of course, uh, as on the title Keys to the Kingdom. And naturally, like I said before, the symbol on the Vatican flag are two overlapping or crossing keys. Next, we come to a situation that is even more 
encased in mental directives based off of emotional stigma. The imparting of emotional stigma, one of their favorite words, stigma. They impart emotional stigma under certain stigma under certain things, cloaking it or wrapping it in a way that uh, it can uh, avoid questioning through uh, creating strong reactions to anybody who looks at it uh, in a analyst uh, and analysis way, way of um, an analytical way. Yeah, that's what I mean. And this, of course, would be the issue of false flags or fake attacks. You do have real attacks, some of which might be publicized, but most of the time they're fake. Or in some way they might be real, but they are lying about the way that they're uh, orchestrated because, of course, naturally the people who are lying about it are the ones that orchestrated it. And they never let a crisis go to waste, as I say. So here we have a Wikipedia article, list of manifestos of mass killers. So for the context of this video, all of these are going to be fake bans, right? Things they pretend to ban, but they do so in a way that they promote it. This is a list of manifestos written by mass killers. Of course, the people who are doing this stuff are mass, mass murderers, mass killers, large, uh, killers of large groups. And their fictional representations of these events are usually designed to leverage their own crimes onto their opposition. As any propagandistic psychological operation of an enemy organization would do. This is a list of manifestos written by mass killers and attempted mass killers explaining their motives for their actions. Many of them have committed the killings to propagate their views. Ugh. So let's get into this tedious, uh, emotionally encased topic, which is all designed to control perspective and naturally promote their objectives. According to a 2020 analysis of 17 mass shooters manifestos, common themes appearing in, the, in them are narcissism, first label, threats to masculinity, paranoia, fame, suicide, ideation, and revenge. So naturally, if you exhibit any of those, then you are akin to a mass shooter. That's how they play that game. Oh, it looks like you're uh, exhibiting signs of being a mass shooter, possibly. Oh, ho, ho. 2017 analysis found the following themes in the manifestos of mass murders. Ego, survival, and revenge. Pseudo-commando mindset. I don't know where they get the pseudo-commando from, because it probably should be sued commando or fake command mindset. Ugh, that are these stupid labels. Obliteration, envy, nihilism, entitlement, and heroic revenge fantasy. Naturally, all of this stuff is used for the uh, holier-than-thou uh, minions that populate the church system and think that they're going around doing God's work and all this other nonsense, who believe themselves to be of the utmost uh, holiness, right? The greatest gifts to life and the world when, and of course, if you question it, then they are very intolerant of your viewpoint. Ha 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 ha. So the FBI conducted a study of 52 lone terrorists in 2019, which found that 96% produced either writings or videos intended to explain their beliefs to others. Of course, they would find that because all of those 52 lone terrorists were fictions created by them. They found that in 88% of cases, perpetrators published their manifestos before the attack occurred or leakage, which is a value opportunity for intervention. Now, they want to intervene and shut down other things, not their fake banned works. So here we got the first example is Industrial Society in its future. We're also going to notice a pattern here, as usual. Ted Kaczynski, English, 19 September 1995, Manifest was published in the Washington Post and the New York Times. Yeah, no surprise there. They might have created it. Probably not. It was probably invented in the university school mechanism. After Kaczynski said he would end his bombing campaign if they did so, the manifesto contends that the Industrial Revolution began a harmful process of natural destruction brought about by technology while forcing humans to adapt to machinery, creating a socio-political order that suppresses human freedom and potential. Three th 
35,000 word manifesto formed the ideological foundation of Kaczynski's 1978 to 1995 mail bomb campaign designed to protect wilderness by hastening the collapse of industrial society. Naturally, if you talk about any of those themes, then you're going to be associated with this alleged mass killer. Next, we have communication from the dead. Robert Flores. Flores mailed a 22-page letter to the Arizona Daily Star. These are all, of course, the phony uh, fake news outlets that are publishing this crap, so go figure. Who later published it online, discussing his reasons for committing the shooting and giving a chronology of his life, stating that it was about setting accounts two of his victims were named in the letter. Unnamed Song Hu Cho, English, 16 April 2017, or 2007. The manifesto was mailed to NBC News. Yeah, go figure. There's the pattern there. All the fake news outlets are the ones publishing these things right now. An hour and a half after Cho had first open fire. Upon receiving the package on April 18, 2007, NBC News contacted authorities and made the controversial decision to publicize Cho's communications by releasing a small fa fraction of what it received. Yeah, they made the controversial decision. Manifesto is described as rambling and incoherent, with Cho criticizing Rich Bratz and referring to the perpetrators of the Columbian High School Massacre as martyrs. But yes, naturally, if you refer to Rich Bratz, then you are going to be labeled as a mass killer, subject to arrest, and have everything you have seized, and you will be disappeared by them. Essentially, that's what they're constructing there. Next is the Natural Selectors Manifesto. Pekka Eric Avin in English Finnish. 7th November 2007. Of course, we do see a certain uptick in certain years, which usually relate to other things. States Avinen published a media package to rapid share that he linked from his YouTube channel. It contains 21 files, including pictures of himself, school, and guns, as well as several word files. The word, fi word files gave background to the attack, with Avinen describing the attack as political terrorism, and that he didn't want to, the attack to be called a school shooting. Of course, and remember, these are all just flags. They are constructing a character and a fictional event with the intention of creating uh, opera violent, usually, operations in reality that correlate. A name, Jim Atkinson, English, 27 July 2008, letter or manifesto found in his vehicle after the shooting attributed his motivation for the rampage is hatred of liberal Democrats, African Americans, and homosexuals. Of course, they get a bunch of labels in there, solidified. Mainly, of course, African-American, being that if you're black, then you're from Africa. As in, if you're skin, you have a certain skin color, then you're inherently and naturally going to be from Africa, and you can come from nowhere else on the planet. Doesn't matter how illogical or impossible such a claim is. 2083, a European Declaration of Independence, Anders Bering Breivik, English, uh, 22nd July 2011. Breivik wrote a manifesto titled 2083, a European Declaration of Independence. It runs 1,518 pages and is credited to Andrew Berwick and Anglicization of Breivik's name. It was emailed to over 1,000 email contacts less than an hour and a half before his bomb went off. Okay, so we do have a mixture here of bombs and guns. All relating to, of course, control of armament to undermine the security of a nation, of free, of free, uh, free state, according to the U.S. Constitution. Of course, here also, if you use the, I, I, um, to talk about the Declaration of Independence, right, then you get associated with this particular activity, this particular action. And naturally, somebody will say, oh, that sounds like such and such uh, active shooter person, right? And then, of course, naturally, you're going to have to spend a lot of time as far as they set up that scheme to um, to defend yourself. Now, usually the natural response would be, oh, that's a false flag. And then, of course, they launch into um, an aggressive stance and attack you for using that word and label because you are using a tactic against, against them, which they're using a tactic against you. And, the, and that's how it goes when you're in a war with uh, operations, uh, psychological operations, and uh, information operations done by uh, enemy intelligence outfits and whatnot. The manifest, Dmitry Vinogradov, Vinogradov, Russian, 7 November 2012, posted on Voktunkt, however you say that, expresses his hatred toward mankind comparing humans to cancer. 
uh, named Christopher Dorner, English, 6th February 2013, the manifest besides anti-police sentiment as a result for reason for killing. And of course, that particular event was all designed as a attack on the military and veterans, specifically. And as, of course, a way to uh, gut the uh, occupational forces, which we would call police, state troopers, sheriffs, etc., so-called law enforcement. Of course, they're enforcing foreign laws uh, illegitimately. And they had to get rid of possible detractors among those ranks, and so this was a way to do it. Using the Christopher Dorner scheme, they could leverage that against anybody they wanted to... Um, extinguished from the so-called law enforcement, <clears throat> specifically, of course, veterans and combat veterans, right? Uh, indicating signs of a Christopher Dorner-like uh, possible future action, right? Your, um, your, uh, I believe it's might have been Minority Report. Uh, that was sort of the um, theme to that movie, plot line. It uh, might have been another one. It was one of those future ones where they tried to apparently stop people from committing crimes in the future before they did it, or seen it in the future. Obviously, that's not exactly how it plays out in reality. In reality, it's they want to get rid of somebody who would be might be a problem for them, so they have to create the pretext for doing that. <clears throat> and these are mainly uh, effective, pre have been at least effective pretexts. Uh, now, not so much. A lot of people nowadays uh, just say that's a false flag. Ragnarok, Alex Herbal, English, 6 April 2014, cites the Columbine shooters as inspiration expressed nihilism. My Twisted World, the story of Elliot Roger, Elliot Roger, English, 3 May 2014, Roger emailed his 107,000 word manifesto, My Twisted World, the story of Elliot Roger, to 34 people, including his therapist, Charles Sophie, his parents and other children. Uh, family, former teachers, and childhood friends, and it said he had originally sought to carry out an attack on Halloween of 2013, but reconsidered because he thought there would be too many police present. And of course, with uh, many of these, especially that one, there is a clear uh, uh, similarity between it and the likely fake um, story of the uh, the young witches in whatever that place in Massachusetts was or whatever, that those uh, phony witch trials in which a lot of people went around, uh, particularly school children, and created lies and other things like that, which were then um, <clears throat> uh, uh, solidified by other contemptuous individuals within the community. So we do see a lot of that playing out today in reality, where you have uh, something set up, a fake story, a uh, falsehood, and then that is carried out and compounded by other individuals who all will show themselves as coordinating together an operation against the people, other people that are their true targets. Next we have Dylan Roof, RTF88, English, 17 June 2015. The manifest was posted on Roof's website, The Last Rhodesian. So there you go. It's a certification of the uh, usual thing of where if, if you talk about Prussians and you're a Nazi, if you talk about Rhodesians, it's the same thing. You're a white supremacist Nazi. You can't talk about it. Which also contains several photos of himself. Roof claimed in the manifesto that he had been radicalized after looking at black on white crime. There you go, of course, folks. In on conflict over skin color and not anything else. Don't look too hard at that. And was led to white supremacist websites. His manifesto is described by an expert on extremism as not belonging to the mainstream of white supremacist ideology. Described by an expert. Yeah, we all know what that means nowadays. Anyway, this is another example of a fake false flag uh, with other designs. My manifesto, Christopher Harper Mercer, English, 1st October 2015. The manifesto was carried on a USB drive and was given to a UCC student in Snyder Hall. Later released by investigators in the manifesto, Harper Mercer wrote his actions were done to serve Satan, who, according to Harper Mercer, would reward murderers in hell by turning them into gods. So, of course, there you go. You're uh, creating hell on earth thing. Uh, nod to the uh, individual that they care, the caricature of Satan, which is constructed by the church, which uh, is all in coordination with the Jesuits and the um, and the Hellenic groups, right? All of them all working together for to set the world on fire, bring Helios to the world, 
course, Helios being the ultimate source of fire of the sun. A large portion of the manifesto was devoted to describing Mercer's hatred of black men. He also described having kinship with various other masses and serial murders, including Ted Bundy, the Columbine shooter, and the Sandy Hook school shooter. Great Replacement, Brent and Tarrant, English, 15 March 2019. Tarrant wrote a 75 page manifesto titled The Great Replacement in reference to the Great Replacement and White Genocide conspiracy theories. Uh, so, of course, yeah, you know, he's obvious uh, labeling here and uh, attempts or methods to target who they see as their opposition and so called conspiracy theorists. Considering conspiracy is a crime listed in the United States Code, but that's generally only leveraged against certain individuals or groups or incorporated into a part of their um, fake uh, RICO takedowns that they make on their street gangs that never seem to get um, <clears throat> get removed. In the manifesto, several anti-immigrant sentiments are expressed, including hate speech against migrants. Yes, and that's, of course, where they solidified the fiction of the hate crime. There's no such thing as a hate crime, of course, except in their bo bogus, illegitimate laws. The only uh, crimes that are legitimate in our context would be according to the U.S. Constitution, of course, which they are all criminals and enemies of that particular uh, document or concept. White supremacist rhetoric and calls for all non-European immigrants in Europe who he claimed to be invading his land to be removed. He also cited the work of other far-right killers such as Anders Breivik and Dylan Roof. And of course we see that with all of these Mostly. Some of them not so much, but most of them. They like to link uh, their fake events to other fake events, likely as a way, a code, if you will, to let, let the um, initiated uh, to whatever level you have to be initiated to be involved in this stuff, uh, know that specifically who's doing it, as in the people who created these also created this one, right? So it's like, if you take your character, then you link your character to your other creations. You know, you, you try to link all of your uh, stories together <coughs> by linking the characters. An open letter, John Ernest, English, 27 April 2019, an anti-Semitic and racist open letter was posted on H hand shortly before the shooting and signed with Ernest's name. Ernest's letter was influenced by Christchurch and took responsibility for the Escondido mosque fire. So... Possibly means they're using anti-Semitic in terms of uh, relation to uh, so-called Middle Easterners, maybe, because generally speaking, that's only used in reference to uh, to somebody who's labeled Jew, even though uh, Semites, generally speaking, are considered to be Middle Easterners. So there's a weird, weird thing going on there with that. Can't always be certain how they're using that particular label. Techno barbarism, a spiritual guide for discontented white men in the current year plus four. Stephen Belliot, English, uh, night October, 2019. Structured in a similar way as the Christchurch Manifesto, it has a list of achievements alluding, alluding to first-person shooter games. Yeah, pretty obvious what they're trying to do there. Vilify uh, specifically a certain fighting age white men. Or basically, just fighting age men. I would I would imagine, not just quote unquote white fighting age men that uh, play first shoot person shooter video games. That is a directly it's a, a target against the fighting capability of uh, the free state. Right. All of this has to do with enemy operations, psychological, and uh, through the, their intelligence outfit, the, the church and the Jesuits and, and the Hellenic groups and stuff. It all has to do with undermining the, secu undermining the security of free state, providing the pretext for doing that. Anyway, unnamed Muhammad Alshmarani, English, 6 December 2019, posted on Alshmarani's Twitter account condemned the United States as a nation of evil for their supposed crimes against Muslim humanity. Script mit builder Tobias Rathian, German, 19 February 2020. In the manifesto, Rathian called for the murder of all people from various non European nations and described himself as an incel, as he had not had a relationship in nearly 20 years out of a fear of the state surveilling him. He also accused Donald Trump of stealing his ideas. So that's a way to target men who have not had sex. 
because they've been doing that for a while, right? In the school system and in, in the church, you are considered a, a ridicule for being a quote-unquote virgin if you're a man. Of course, if you're a woman, then, uh, you know, women always try to pretend to be virgins, especially the ones that are popular, despite the fact that everybody knows they're not. So, you know, that's how that whole joke goes. It's all revolving around physical things and not um, uh, intellectually uh, conceptual things. Um, a Wide Awakening, Nathaniel Veltman, English, 6 June 2021, inspired by Christchurch Terrorist Manifesto. The manifesto was found on some drive inside of residence. So a lot of these were created by the same fictional writer as the one that invented the Christchurch event. And so, you know, a lot of them are going to be linked to that particular one because that was uh, a fiction that was created by the same person. You wait for a signal while your people wait for you. Peyton Gendron, English, 12 May 2022. There's a, there's a coded title for you there. And, of course, this is made by the same uh, individual or entity. T titled after a quote from Christchurch Terrorist. There you go with that link again. Manifesto is focused on mass immigration and holds anti-black feed. So, this, of course, is, uh, has a lot to do with BLM stuff. Even though it's in 2022. And, uh, naturally uh, helps to divert not only threaten of course um, foreigners which they hate they want to hate everybody but it's also designed to distract attention away from foreign agents and to put the blame onto the uh, people who just travel and travel for tourism reasons or for uh, work or something like that. And so that's, of course, so they can uh, uh, send their thugs to extort money from them uh, while the foreign agents are completely wrecking everything in your face, basically, because they think they're so secretive. The manifesto was originally posted on Google Docs two days before the attack and had not been modified since. The author describes himself as someone who initially identified himself as being on the authoritarian left before he developed American neo-Nazi, anti-Semitic, eco-fascist, ethno-nationalist, populist, and white supremacist views influenced by Tarrant Brevik, Roof, Ernest, Robert Powers, and the Daily Stormer. The manifesto is largely plagiarized from the Great Replacement. Of course it is, because these are made by the same person. These are all fictions being invented by... The person could be a juridic person, right? Could be an entity. But either way, they're all linked together because they're all, they all have the same author. As well. And naturally, they all... Uh, are designed in the same way to put labels and project them onto uh, specific individuals that they can put into caricatures and, of course, to control the thought about the so-called issues of the day as according to the uh, purpose of the citizenship director in schools from the Cardinal Principles of Secondary Education from 1918. Downward Spiral of Ethan Miller, Ethan Miller, English, 28 August 2022, posted on Wattpad, the manifesto describes his isolation and solitude, as well as interpretation by Columbine, Columbine High School Massacre. So, the link to the Columbine High School Massacre event tells you that this has the same author, just like that other one, uh, just like the Christ Church author has authored so many other false flags. Postmodernism and its consequences for our nation. Unknown first name Isaac, the Q. Portuguese. 26 September 2022. A few hours before committing a shooting at Barreras. Probably Barreras, actually. Two R's are in each. School. The perpetrator published a manifesto on his Twitter account. In his manifesto, the per perpetrator claimed to be superior to others. In addition to containing speeches in favor of racial supremacy and hate speeches against different communities, such as LGBT community. Yeah, go figure. These things always have the same motives behind them. Solidification of protection for certain groups and villainization of others. Residents of Bahia and the school community itself, in addition to state that his intentions were to murder as many people as possible, that they felt divine wrath. And there you go with a, yet another example of how these false flags are perpetrated out of individuals or groups within the churches, specifically the uh, Hellenic and the Jesuits, with their mission of bring hell or set the world on fire.
One of the ways to do that, of course, is to create these facades, freak people out with their um, propagation of these fake stories, and and cause uh, uh, cause the uh, implementation of control over particular subjects, and also obviously protect themselves and their institution from investigation, ridicule, or uh, justice for their crimes. Called arms, Huraj, or Uraj, whatever, it's a Polish name, Krasik, Krasik, English, 12th October 2022, just a few hours before the attack links to a 65-page long manifesto were posted on Twitter in the document. The author does not provide their name, claiming it is not of importance and will be known later anyway, but identifies himself as a man of Slovak, okay, origin born on July 28, 20, uh, 2003, who has decided to execute an operation against the enemies of the white race. Ugh, yeah, stupid caricatures, they're always the same. The manifesto blames Jews and LGBT people for causing harm to white people and celebrates mass murders, including Breivik and the perpetrators of Christchurch mock shootings and Poway synagogue shooting. And naturally, as all this goes, most of these are made by the same author. Unnamed Aiden Hale, English, 27th March, 2023. Hale's manifesto was not originally released to the public, pending a lawsuit for the release by November 6, 2023. Three pages were linked online by Stephen Crowder, followed by the National MPD opening and investigation. The leaked manifesto included far-left views, anti-white sentiments, extreme hatred for those Hale considered to have white privilege. The linkage page also included the plan Hale will go through the day of the shooting, with the top page being adorned with the words death day. So, I don't know exactly who created this one not the person who created the Christ Church one because those always follow the same pattern, right? This is interesting because this is almost the opposite of that. And because, uh, as you would might say, finally, <laughs> there's a false flag from the so-called left side of the aisle. A lot of people on the so-called right would look at that and seize on it and say, look, they're doing it too, right? And so that way you can get the other people uh, that would otherwise call it a false flag to solidify, right? Of course, anybody who knows what's going on would just say, no, that's that's just a lie. The fiction never happened. There's a lot of things going on here, though. For one, it kind of flips the script on the LGBTQ plus people who were essentially set up as cover and scapegoats to begin with. Anyway. Uh, for, you know, who the church uh, criminal people operating under the church cover of the church. Jesuits, Hellenic individuals, all those um, groups and uh, lodges and sects and stuff, people who think they run everything. But uh, this one also establishes um, an avenue for control of the police department and so-called conservatives and to bolster defense and protection for uh, the, as we will see, religious churches, which uh, seems to be a, a new theme. Uh, religious church schools, actually, is what I mean. The last one is a white boy summer to remember. Ryan Paul Mater, English, 26 August 2023. Paul Mater, three manifestos, two of which were not released to the public. One of them was released by the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. It contains sentiments of racism against African Americans. In anti Semitism, he cited the perpetrator of the Christchurch whose shooting was the main inspiration for his methods and targets. So there's your Christchurch author again. So whoever that person, individual group is, they should definitely be found out and shut down, or I guess just leave them there to keep perpetuating these things because it um, just adds more patterns to the formation of their operations and makes it more obvious this allow it to flush out other criminals that are involved. Obviously, most of these so-called law enforcement departments, right, the one above it establishes the police, the one below it establishes the sheriff's protection. Also gives them pretext uh, to uh, bolster their operations so that nobody will question it when there's a lot more activity around certain areas, say Florida or uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, in these two contexts, because they'll just say, oh, this all has to do with a recent shooting, right? So they can go around and harass, attack their opposition in the community with impunity because everyone's just going to assume it has something to do with the church or the um, school church school shooting event that has been lied about, broadcasted as their pretext. Of course, it also 
provides uh, psychological protection for them because then everyone can say, oh, look at these heroes and what they're doing and whatnot. So it's a boon for the so-called law enforcement outfits too, which makes them involved because they jump on the bandwagon and then they use these events as a way to increase funding for the departments and to go around and increase their control over the community. So it goes when you have the occupational forces working uh, to establish overt foreign control and to undermine the uh, safety and security of a free state. Finally, we have the inconvenient truth. Patrick Crocius, English, 3rd August 2019, El Paso Police Chief Greg Allen said that they are reasonably confident that a manifesto titled The Inconvenient Truth was posted by a suspect on the online message board 8chan shortly before the shooting. The manifesto in question is explicitly inspired by Christ Church. Of course it is, because it's made by the same author. Now, I was sort of duped by this, where I went and looked up the so-called manifesto, of which all the other ones I never bothered looking at. I looked at this one specifically in 2019 because of all the things that were surrounding uh, the uh, operation to take firearms, which was then obfuscated by COVID, which was then obfuscated by BLM, etc. And everybody forgot about the fact that the police were all going to go and kick in doors and kill people to take all of their weapons, as a occupational force would do when it's acting on behalf of enemy interests, obviously. So, uh, I don't remember this, the, the document was not really well written, but that wasn't the point. The point was to propagate the fiction and naturally the fake ban, because obviously it was never banned and it was readily available. So it didn't have it contain anything particularly useful to read. It's just important to understand uh, that these are fictions. They're created with uh, intentions of enemy psychological operations against the public, the populace, and the security of free state. And we know who's doing it, right? The, the, the church organizations that hide behind churches, uh, anyway, they have a flock of sheep that they use as their protective shield ignorantly and hide among them. Wolf and sheep clothing idea, all that. The con men, right? But <clears throat> these, these fictions are created for particular ends, particular purposes. And when you read them, you'll find anomalies which don't make any sense and can only happen in fiction because they can't happen in reality. Now, also, if you look up uh, The Inconvenient Truth, as a manifesto, you get an inconvenient truth that bogus uh, crap from allegedly Al Gore about um, nonsensical things that re refer to nature, although it's all coded language and stuff like that, which I guarantee is has something to do with the propagation, but it's entirely possible that the people, individuals that create these false flag scenarios, especially the Christchurch one, are linked to the creation of movies, and TV shows. Directors, producers, etc., they have skill in doing these things. And they're, generally speaking, CIA Jesuit, Hellenic, etc., all part of the part of the lodges, rotary clubs, etc. And they, uh, their particular craft are psychological operations against the enemy being we the people are their enemy. So the 2019 El Paso shooting, on August 3rd, 2019, a mass shooter shooting occurred at a Walmart store in El Paso, Texas, United States. The gunman, 21-year-old Patrick Wood Crucius, notice that ridiculous name there, Crucius, right? Like a cross, crucifix, Ugh. killed 23 people and injured 22 others. So he killed 23 people and injured 22. Something going on with the numerology there, the word count, or uh, number count. Both word count and number count. That's the coded language. Of course, the Federal Bureau of Investigation investigated shooting as an act of domestic terrorism and a hate crime. Naturally, they would, because the event never happened, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation does not actually do what they pretend to do. 
And so naturally they have to set up the um, bogus um, label of hate crime and domestic terrorism uh, with ends to go after uh, the fighting age males in the uh, place that they're attempting to undermine the security of free state. Shooting has been described as the deadliest attack on Latinos in modern American history. That phrase right there is one of the many dead giveaways that this is written by somebody. This uh, thing is written by somebody who is either being extorted for their labor in the school system, has no concept of history, or it's just uh, a method to try and sensationalize a fictional event to rapid and more emotional nonsense. That's because if we're using the what most people would think of as Latinos, it relates to anybody who's from Mexico or south of Mexico, which are all included in the American continent, right? So this is saying that this event outstrips all events of inter-gang warfare between Latino gangs, like the Latin Kings, etc., in the United States, all the different uh, civil wars that have happened, all, all the events, right? This singular one was the deadliest out of every attack on Latinos. It doesn't say deadliest attack on Latinos by non-Latinos, right? It just says on Latinos. So there you go. Broad declarations with no basis in reality, solidifying emotionalism around the event, generally happens when somebody is lying. Crucius surrendered and was arrested and charged with capital murder in connection with his shooting. He posted a manifesto with white nationalist and anti-immigrant themes on the image board eight chan shortly before the attack. So that, of course, protects uh, foreign agents that we have everywhere and naturally uh, selects the white nationalist moniker. And naturally, manifesto cites Christchurch mocks shootings earlier that year and the far-right conspiracy theory known as the Great Replacement as inspiration for the attack. That uh, Great Replacement, of course, was next succeeded by the Great Reset versus the Great Awakening. And all of this naturally has to do with the imposition of overt foreign control because we've been under covert foreign control for a very long time now, since at least the 1860s. On February 8th, 2023, following an announcement that the Department of Justice would not seek the death penalty, Crucius pleaded guilty to 19 federal murder and hate crime charges. Yes, that's because they want to resurrect him as a character for future fake events and keep his story going. Because unfortunately, if they put him to death, then his story ends there, just like with the other uh, fake mass murderers who died in their attempts. They can't uh, then be you know, continuously regurgitated and talked about, promoted. On July 7th, 2023, Crucius was sentenced to 1990 consecutive life sentence, but he's currently pending trial for state charges that would still potentially result in death penalty under Texas state jurisdiction found guilty. That's called building suspense. Next, we come to the 2023 Jacksonville shooting. Now, this is a, a appears to be the newer angle, right? So, the previous ones, right, you had the attack on the church, Christ Church. Even though it wasn't actually at a church, it was on a mosque in Christ Church. So you got a double whammy there. You got a place named Christ Church where it's an attack on a mosque. And then all of these link to stuff that hell has to do with um, national origin and things like that, right? It's a pattern. So this new pattern all has to do with the insulation of specifically religious private schools, it appears. And the reason why they would do that is because they're currently engaged in criminal activity there. And the groups that they are attempting to uh, solidify a psychological defense for would, of course, be the Hellenic Jesuit uh, Helios Hell on Earth orders seeking to do all of this nasty stuff and get away with it. And of course, one of the ways to do that is with uh, insulation through psychological protection and uh, emotionally manipulated minions to go around and defend them and defend their crimes ignorantly. 
So here it states on August 26, 2023, three people were totally fatally shot by a gunman in a mass shooting that took place at a Dollar General store in Jacksonville, Florida. Authorities identified 21-year-old white male Ryan Christopher Palmeter as the gunman. Names are clearly created like the CIA names, such as a attorney showing up named Deadman. Palmeter shot and killed himself after he barricaded himself in an office. The incident has been described as a terrorist attack, was racially motivated, and is currently under investigation of hate crime. So we're never going to see that character again because they killed him off. Can't re-resurrect him. But, who knows, they might try. You never know. They might try to re-resurrect it in some strange manner. According to police, by 11.39 a.m., Paul Meter left his home in Clay County, Florida. At 12.48 p.m., he arrived at Edward Waters University and released a TikTok video of him putting on a tactical vest. All right, so clearly they want to go after body armor. And the time frame. All right, so that's he left his home in Clay County. They don't say where, of course, in Clay County. Just say Clay County. 11.39 a.m. And arrived at 12.48 p.m. So that took him a total of... So that's 11 plus 48 minutes. So that's 59 minutes, almost an hour to go there, assuming he drove, and he's 21, so that must have been a lot of traffic. It is around noon, so I suppose that's possible, especially considering the area and all the construction going on. 12.55 p.m., campus security arrived at his location and asked for identification. Okay, he arrives at 12.48, and... Seven minutes later, campus security asks for identification. It does not sound right. Uh, campus security, as far as I'm aware, is not that thorough, and they're not that quick. They don't just go up to somebody after they've been parked for seven minutes and ask for identification. Quite ridiculous. Paul Meter failed to identify himself and left the parking lot at 12.57 p.m. So he left two minutes later. He was shadowed by a campus security officer who was leaving at 12.58 p.m. So a minute later, 4.108 p.m., the campus officer flagged down a police officer who then started processing a BOLO report. That sounds highly unlikely, very improbable, but so it would go when you're writing a fictional account. Some people are good at it, other people not so much. But you don't have to be that good at it when you have all of your cronies, your systems, and all your minions, uh, and all of your uh, fellows that work, and your odd fellows that work in different areas, to all assist you in the propagation of this fiction. So at 1.08 p.m., an 11-round count shot spotter 911 alert went off, caused by Paul Meter shooting 11 rounds in the front windshield of a car outside the Dollar General store, killing the driver. Then entered the store and killed another victim. Security footage showed Paul Meter wearing a tactical vest, a face covering, blue rubber gloves, and ear protection during the shooting. So all of those things, of course, they want to go after. And they also want to make sure that if you're wearing that stuff out, that you'll get attacked. Because everyone's going to assume that you're an active shooter. So you can't wear tactical vests in the open anymore. You can't wear face coverings in the open anymore, despite COVID, of course. Or blue rubber gloves and ear protection. Blue rubber gloves, I would imagine, refer to the uh, surgical gloves that you will wear if you're lacing people's protest signs, like uh, that little um, CIA fat lady CIA operative was passing out signs. Not wearing a mask, but wearing those uh, the surgical gloves, probably because those uh, signs had been laced with chemicals designed as uh, to incite the people that uh, carried them, college students and whatnot. Also, this person shot 11 rounds in the front windshield of a car. Why specifically 11? Is that because maybe he had 10-round magazine with one in the chamber? That's about the only logical explanation. Of course, it doesn't say which firearms the person was carrying. Not to mention, emptying an entire magazine of a 10 rounds and one in the chamber into a windshield seems highly improbable. And they would just say, oh, the person was unstable. Yeah. You know? That's why the person was unstable. Of course, then he walked into the store and then killed another victim, which would have to mean that he reloaded or had a different weapon. Of course, usually when they describe these things, the person is carrying a lot of weapons, which is also improbable.
Lots of people fled through this store's rear exit, the palm meter exiting the same door shortly after. 1 9 p.m., a one round shot spotter alert went off, followed by a palm meter re entering the store through the rear door and attempting to shoot a security camera but missing. At that time, the first 9 11 voice call was received at 1 10 p.m. Two more customers entered the store through the front door at 1 30 p.m. Paul Meter killed one of them, then chased the other person around the store, shooting at her, but missing the victim being chased, was able to exit through the rear door with Paul Meter following after her, shooting out the same door and then re entering the building. Of course, naturally, that person can hit individuals, but then uh, misses a security camera and then doesn't keep trying to shoot the security camera. That sounds like a staged event that you would find in a movie in Hollywood, from Hollywood. At 1.14 p.m., Paul Meter entered an office. Four minutes later, he sent a text message to his father, instructing him to use a screwdriver to enter his room. There, his father found a last will and testament and a suicide note in Paul Meter's laptop. At 1.19 p.m., 11 minutes after the first shots were fired, police officers entered the building and heard a single shot suspected to be Paul Meter killing himself. Parents contacted the police at 1.53 p.m. At 3.44 p.m., SWAT confirmed Paul Meter was dead. At least three manifestos were found on his body, including those addressed to his parents, the news media, and federal agents. All three victims were black, consistent with an intent to kill black people, as Paul Meter stated in the manifesto. Yep, yeah, that is just a perfectly wrapped in a tight bow, nice little fiction. Absolutely nothing happened that would happen in reality. Everything went according to plan. It all happened perfectly for their designs. And so it goes when you're writing a complete fiction. Reality is not so uh, <laughs> perfectly lined up in all the uh, events, right? Reality has things that happen which uh, uh, show it to be reality, right? Like um, just weird stuff that could only happen in reality. Stranger than fiction is usually the term used. So more of their background story and ridiculousness in these fictions. Three people, of all whom were black, were fatally shot. The victims were identified as Angela Mitchell Carr, 52, Gerald Gillian, 29, and Arnold Joseph Laguerre, Jr., 19. Laguerre was an employee at the store. Now, it's, uh, of course, uh, surprising that they don't say that this was the worst attack on, quote-unquote, African-Americans, to inject that label into there, as in skin color makes you means you're from Africa, no matter what. The shooter, Ryan Christopher Palmeter, November 28, 2001 to August 26, 2023, was a 21-year-old white male from Orange Park, Florida, who lived in the Oak Leaf plantation, plantation area of Jacksonville before he killed himself during the shooting. So let's um, solidify the uh, skin color scenario. Skin color versus skin color, right? Paul Mayer was a former student at both Oak Leaf High School and Flagler College. In 2016, he was the subject of a domestic police call between him and his brother. In 2017, he was the subject of a Baker Act call used to place persons under involuntary detainment for mental health examination for up to 72 hours. During the call, Palmeter told police that he was distressed and planned to kill himself by jumping off the Bank of America Tower in downtown Jacksonville. Because he was a minor and was not committed to mental health care, he was allowed to purchase firearms as an adult. That's not quite how that stuff works. Jacksonville police showed images of Palmeter's AR style rifle, bearing a swastika and racial slurs drawn in white sharpie along with the Glock pistol without marking. All right, so Glock pistol, might hold 11 rounds in California. However, in Jacksonville, Florida, I expect most people would carry a Glock with 15 rounds. So 11 rounds into a windshield. That's unlikely. If you're going to empty 11 rounds into a windshield, you're probably going to empty the entire magazine, which would be more than, that, more than 11 with a Glock in Florida, most likely. But who knows, it could have been 10. We'll give it the benefit of the doubt there. Air 15 style rifle doesn't mean anything. It just means it is in the style of Armalite 15, which is a trademark. He acquired the pistol in April 2023 and the rifle in June 2023. Both weapons were obtained legally through FFL transfer. That means the uh, federal firearms license, I think, which required background checks, and the police said Palmeter was legally allowed to possess them. Palmeter's vest had a Rhodesian army patch on it. So there we go. There's a, a nod, and also a way to solidify the fact that you can't talk about Rhodesia, a symbol which had previously been used by other white supremacists, including Dylan Roof, the perpetrator of the Christchurch shooting. 
Naturally, if you say anything that is not absolutely negative and completely emotional about Rhodesia, then you're a white supremacist. And that's how it goes. And, of course, this was perpetrated by the same creator of the Christ Church fiction. In a manifesto reviewed by Rolling Stone shortly after the shooting, Palmier denounced Eminem and Machine Gun Kelly for their close ties to black musicians, identifying them as potential targets. He also praised mass killers like Timothy McVeigh, Anders Bering, Breivik, and Swing Hu Cho. So there you got your linking, and of course you've got uh, insulation of Hollywood uh, criminals, as far as the uh, people that play them, because those are all druidic entities, right? They're um, also fictions. They have multiple actors that play those roles. They're fake names, you know. Eminem is not a real name. You know, Machine Gun Kelly and the people that are pretending to be them, the backstories about them are, generally speaking, bogus. In response to the shooting, President Joe Biden, also played by actors, said that the white supremacy has no place in America. He also noted that the shooting has taken place on the same day as the commemoration of the 60th anniversary of March in Washington, famous civil rights rally. Yeah, that's no accident. Governor Ron DeSantis issued a statement in which he referred to Paul Meter as a scumbag and a coward for killing himself instead of facing responsibility for his actions. There's another show voter for you. De sanctimonious. <laughs> On August 27th, DeSantis visited Jacksonville to attend a vigil for the victims. When he attempted to address the crowd, he was heckled, forcing him to step away from the microphone. Yeah, no crap. <sighs> if prompt, it prompted Jacksonville Councilwoman Jacoby Pittman to step in and ask the mourners to settle down, saying, We're going to put parties aside because it ain't about parties today before I eat a bullet. Don't know a party. Bullet, don't know a party. So. That's not the reason why, obviously, De Sanctimonious was not desired there, probably. And the so-called mourners, if that's in fact what they were, would naturally be a bunch of sheeple, sheep people, who are being uh, navigated, probably at the church groups and whatnot, to go to events to make it look like there's... But who knows how many there are because they lie about absolutely everything, especially Wikipedia. Florida State Representative Angie Nixon criticized the sanctimonious and called the shooting a stark reminder of the dangerous consequences of unchecked racism. Unchecked racism. That carries a sinister threat to it. They're going to check your racism. They're going to call you racist and then they're going to check you. That sounds like when they're going to uh, take care of someone. You know, like the mafia says, we're going to take care of, and insert blank, you know what it means. Same thing when it comes to the medical industry, we're going to take care of the elderly, right? And that's the same thing here. They're going to check your racism. It's a threat from an enemy organization. So the Edward Waters University is a private Christian historically black university in Jacksonville, Florida. It was founded in 1866 by members of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AIM Church, as a school to educate freedmen and their children. It was the first independent institution of higher education, the first historically black college in the state of Florida. It continues to be affiliated with the AIM Church and is a member of the Independent Colleges and University of Florida. So with that event, despite the fact that it happened in a, apparently a Dollar General, they get to, in their fiction, institute... Uh, psychological protection of this particular entity. It's possible and likely that this particular entity is involved in pretty heinous crimes and they're wrapped in the protection of the so-called freeing of the slaves from 1860. Slaves, of course, being the idea of a forced worker who is gains nothing from their work, which is everybody today. We are all forced to work and we gain nothing from that work. It all goes to somebody else. So, in their fiction, they get protection from ignorant uh, people of many different skin colors. But mainly they have an ignorant army of sheeple that they use as their shield and to hide among. So this event gives them the ability to coordinate and uh, use those groups to protect themselves, despite the fact that they uh, weren't apparently actually the target of that event. Anyway, the AIM Church was the first independent black denomination in the United States and was founded in 1816 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. After the Civil War, it sent numerous missionaries to the South to plant AIM churches. The first African Methodist Episcopal pastor in the state, William G. Stewart, 
Originally named the College Brown Theological Institute. That's a nice last name there, Stewart. Charles H. Pierce was also involved in establishing an educational institution for the church in Jacksonville. Struggling with some financial difficulties, the school closed for much of the 1870s. It reopened in 1883 as East Florida Conference High School, then changed to East Florida Scientific and Divinity High School. Over the next 10 years, the curriculum was expanded in 1892. The school was renamed Edward Waters, the third bishop of the same church. And there you go. More pattern, name shifting, changing locations. It's probably not the original location. So it goes. And that's the pattern of their behavior, and we know who they are. They're the enemy organizations, the Hellenic, the Jesuit, the various groups that hide behind other groups and attempt to engage in psychological war operations of enemy warfare on uh, behalf of foreign interests, and obviously to get away with that, because they see us. Unfortunately, many don't yet see them as they are, which, is, which are enemies, foreign enemies. Next, we have the 2023 Nashville school shooting, and this, of course, has many motives behind it, just like all the rest. On March 27, 2023, a mass shooting occurred at the Covenant School, a Presbyterian church in American Parochial Elementary School in the Green Hills. Neighborhood of Nashville, Tennessee, when 28 year old Aiden Hale, born Audrey Elizabeth Hale, a transgender man and former student of the school, killed three nine-year-old children and three adults before being shot and killed by two Metropolitan Nashville Police Department MNPD officers. It is the deadliest mass shooting in Tennessee history. And there you go again. How can they say it's the deadliest mass shooting in Tennessee history? That's because it doesn't matter if that's true or not. It just matters that they can, they can put the emotional stigma on it with that phrase. I thought that MNPD meant Minneapolis Police Department. Oh, well. Um, it actually means Met Metropolitan Nashville Police Department. I don't know why it's just not NPD, Nash uh, Nashville Police Department. That's pretty weird. Anyway, this, of course, allows for the uh, psychological inculcation of protection for their uh, occupational law enforcement. And also, this event is around another uh, private school, involves anyway, around a private uh, religious school where, uh, of course, children are exploited. There's a lot of child trafficking and a lot of other creepy things that go on around those entities. And, of course, naturally, Jesuits and Hellenic uh, operatives and things like that, um, foreign enemies, trying to set the world on fire. They all hide behind these institutions and behind the children there. And so both of these events in 2023 give them the ability to insulate their uh, centers from investigation, ridicule, or... And, of course, also, if somebody is, in fact, releasing information about these entities, these events will completely wash away anything else. Because if you try to look up those places, you're only going to get this stuff. The Covenant School is a private Christian school in the Green Hills neighborhood of Nashville. It educates students from pre garden to the sixth grade. It was founded in 2001 as the ministry of Nashville's Covenant Presbyterian Church, a congregation of the Presbyterian Church in America. Its enrollment is about 200 students. So clearly, this the main focus of both of these events is the is inculcating protection for or, or propagating protection for these institutions. So, background, I already read that. Shooting, Hale drove to school arriving at 9.54 a.m. CDT at 9.57, Hale sent an Instagram message to an old friend saying an earlier post was basically a suicide note anticipating dying that day. Of course, naturally, all of this stuff is to make it look, this is their fictional police report, right? Uh, relative time frames to make it look official. But there's all kinds of issues that pop up with the information because it's fictional. A friend who received the message called a crisis hotline and contacted Davidson County Sheriff's Office at 2013. Okay. So, Instagram message was sent in 957. Assume that's in the morning. And 20 minutes later, is that right? No, that's 16 minutes later. Uh, the person called the sheriff's office, but first called a crisis hotline. I don't know about you, but I've never heard of conversations and phone calls, two phone calls and two conversations about this type of thing that can happen in 16 minutes. 
in addition, why wouldn't you call the sheriff's office first, right? Most people are trained to do that anyway. At 1011, Hale armed with a rifle, carbine, and a pistol. So carbines, generally speaking, have rifling in them. And so does a pistol. This probably is written by somebody who means a bolt action, likely a rifle. But who knows? Carbine, of course, being a 16-inch AR-style weapon, probably what they're referring to here. Either way, this was lit written by somebody who has no concept of reality as it comes to warfare and combat uh, arms, uh, weapons, and things like that. Shot through a set of glass side doors and entered the building. That sounds like something from a movie. At 10.13, police received a call about an active shooter. When police arrived at the scene, the teacher told an officer that the students were in lockdown and two were missing. Officers entered the building at around 10.23. So... They received a call at 10.13, and it took them 10 minutes to get to the building. Yeah, that doesn't sound right at all. While clearing the first floor of students and staff, they heard gunshots coming from the second floor. Well, okay. Some people would say yes, they could get there in 10 minutes. However, it states that they received a call 10.13. That means probably most likely the dispatcher received a call, which means the dispatcher had to send them out. And depending, obviously, on their vicinity, you know, of course, you can have all of this stuff happen perfectly fine and everything line up perfectly when you're writing fiction, right? In reality, things don't happen like that. Well, clearing the first floor of students and staff, they heard gunshots coming from the second floor. Officers stepped over a victim on the second floor as they made their way to Hale. At 1025, a five-member team approached Hale and two officers fired four times each, killing Hale by 1027, 14 minutes after the initial 911 call made. The threat was neutralized. In total, Hale fired more than 150 rounds. A reunification center was set up by MNPD at the Woodmont Baptist Church. Students were taken there by school bus in the afternoon. Now, of course, this is showing you the clear connection between these false flags and the churches, right? That's obvious. And their motive, their primary motive, is to insulate protection for their criminal enterprises that are operated out of churches. So victims, six people, three students, and three staff were killed at random. Five were pronounced dead at a hospital, one at the scene. The deceased students were Evelyn Dakehouse, William Keeney, and Haley Scruggs, all age nine. The deceased faculty members were substitute teacher Cynthia Peake, 61 custodian Mike Hill, 61, and head of school Catherine Kuntz, 60. In addition, a police officer was injured after cutting his hand on shattered glass. Aiden Hale, previously referred to by the police birth name Audrey Elizabeth Hale, was a 28-year-old former student of the Covenant School and a Nashville resident with no criminal record, according to former headmaster of the Covenant School. Hale attended school when around 10 years of age. MNPD police officer John Drake said Hale was under the care for an emotional disorder and had legally purchased seven firearms, including three recovered from the shooting scene between October 2020 and June 2022. All right, so this person was under care for emotional disorder and was able to purchase seven firearms? I don't think so. Not to mention, this is a perfect example of somebody who is using a bait, right? This is a bait because this is from the so-called transgender, the sort of the, the church, of, um, propagandistic church entity of, of you know who, who are setting up one of their scapegoats, one of their covers, in a way that it will uh, appeal to um, another group. So this probably wouldn't have been made by the Christ Church author, considering that author follows a certain line of, uh, of um, pattern. Police first referred to Hale as a woman and used his birth name on the day of the shooting. MNPD Chief John Drake said that authorities feel that Hale identifies as trans, but we're still in the initial investigation into all of that. Of course you are, because it never happened and the purse doesn't exist. Just like with companies, they can be both male and female because nobody cares because they weren't born. And when you have a fictional character, they weren't born either. Media sources subsequently reported Hale was a trans man, his former art teacher and former classmate called him coming out as transgender on Facebook in 2022, according to a friend Hale on childlike obsession with Stan Child. So that, of course, they're solidifying the fact that it is, in fact, a real person because he has a Facebook page, right? 
because you can't fabricate Facebook pages. No, that's impossible. Hale was an illustrator and graphic designer who graduated from the Nosy College of Art and Design in 2022. A neighbor said Hale lived with his parents. Naturally, if you are a man or woman, a person that lives with their parents, then you are likely to be a shooter and to be crazy. And that's how these things go. And one of the reasons why I personally know that is because I was in, when I was in high school, right, uh, I was different and mistreated for being different as far as I had been in homeschool until fifth grade, right? And I practiced martial arts and I did a bunch of other stuff. And so you can't, they couldn't, you know, really pick on me physically and they, they couldn't uh, bully me in any other ways because I would respond appropriately to that stuff. So they had to go around and say that I was likely to be a school shooter, right? They tell me that to my face, like, oh, if anybody's likely to be a school shooter, it's definitely you. So you see this stuff in the school system, and uh, it doesn't work so well in the Marine Corps. When I, you know, I joined the Marine Corps, and so it doesn't really work that well there, because everybody would just look at you and be like, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, you know, we're all... <laughs> We're all trained to be killers, right? <laughs> it doesn't work so well in the military, especially not the Marine Corps. But either way, this is all about insulation and targeting. Insulation of certain elements and targeting of others. That's what you do in a psychological operation. You want to attack the enemy psychologically, emotionally, with every method that you can, informationally. And you want to protect your own organizations and structures. All of these events have the same pattern of psychological operations from the usual enemy components being the Hellenic Jesuit, etc. So investigation, the MNPD took the head of the investigation of the shooting, assisted by the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, Bureau of, C Bureau of Alcohol, Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. See, they do good things, right? You know, they're good people. They're heroes. Yeah. They don't go around thuggishly beating up people and taking their stuff and then uh, invoking arbitrary extortionist measures, taking people's money out of through uh, the force of a gun, etc., like all of these things do in controlling and, and uh, criminally uh, usurping the U.S. Constitution. No, they don't do that because they stop active shooters. All right? Two shotguns, one of which was sawed off, and other evidence was found in search of the Hales house. Hmm... Didn't the person have seven firearms, right? Okay, so let's do a count. He brought a rifle, carbine, and pistol to school. So they found two shotguns, uh, one of which was sawed off, and other evidence was found in a search of Hale's house. Evidence included a detailed map of the school, potential entry points, and a manifesto. Hale was believed to have undertaken reconnaissance and had originally considered targeting another location, but had decided not to carry out the attack due to the level of security of the prejudices. So that's five guns that have been listed. Let's see if there's two others. On April 3, police said Hale planned a shooting for months and fired 152 rounds of the school, 126 of them 556 five, rounds, and 26 of them 9mm rounds. So yeah, carbine AR5 or AR style, 556, five, yeah. 26 pistol, 126 556 five, rifle. So is that from the rifle or is that from the carbine? Did he even use the other one? Not to mention, that is a lot of ammunition for six people. Right? 126 rounds is, well, let's see. Uh, most magazines will hold like 30. Uh, and then you might have one in the chamber. So that would be 31. And then you have to divide that by, let me see, to get 126 out of uh, it. Four magazines, I think. So it's 60, 90, 100, and yeah. So it's a, a little bit over five magazines. <sighs> That's a lot of weight. <laughs> That's a lot of weight. That's quite a, quite a big... That's Yeah, that's a lot. And uh, of course, you would have to change out magazines. Yeah, that's a, so many issues logically and realistically with these stories. 
As of April 14, 2023, police have not publicly disclosed a motive for the shooting. Hale's surviving writings, including diaries and planning document, initially called a manifesto, were described as police as rambling and empty of any specific political or social issues. Three pages of Hale's diary described by CNN as containing hateful language directed by the school and his children were leaked to conservative commentary Stephen Crowder on November 6, 2023. So yeah, obviously all of the same propagandist outlets are involved in these things as usual. Reactions of Covenant School issued a statement asking for privacy during the law enforcement investigation. Yeah, okay, so the Covenant School issued a statement asking for privacy during the law enforcement investigation. That's how you'd read that. Several vigils were held for the casualties, a memorial at the school gathered items such as flowers, balloons, and stuffed animals. Yeah, look at how nice the school is. They're, they're heroes, right? And, and the, the law enforcement are there doing their job. I don't know why you would say such horrible things about them. Like, they would just make all this stuff up so that they can, you know, like, get a... Uh, um, attention. Yeah. Churches aren't known for doing that ever. No, they, that's, they don't have martyrs and things like that that are all designed to use death as a way to get attention. Oh, and they definitely don't constantly go around talking about the death of Jesus. No, they don't do that. Mm -mm. No, they don't try to use all these things to get attention from people and control perception and stuff like that and set themselves up as martyrs every time they get involved with crimes. Now, the Jesuits never did that. No, they never, you know, put up a memorial for 23 people that apparently died at Martyrs Hill when, in fact, there were 61 of them that were executed by the Japanese for crimes against the state. It had nothing to do with that. No, they were being persecuted for being Christian, right? And they would never use death for personal gain. Never. A memorial concert was held at the Fisher Center at Belmont University with artists including Carrie Underwood, Tyler Hubbard, Colony House, Thomas Rhett performing. Wow. So they had a party. They had a party. And they are all death worshippers. And I'm using worshipper in the context of they like death and they revel in it, not in the context of worshipping as in study. All proceeds benefited the school staff, students, and families. City of Nashville set up a fund to support those affected. The Community Foundation Middle of Tennessee was established when the Covenant School Bill Fund. We created a list with verified similar fundraisers. So yeah, fundraising. Using the event to raise funds. Go figure. Several notable Nashville musicians, including Mickey Guiton, Margot Price, and Cheryl Crow, offered their condolences in anger about continual school shootings. Actress Melissa Joan Hart, who was nearby when the shooting occurred, helped escort some of the fleeing children to safety, recounted the experience on Instagram a day later. Ugh, this is so much crap. It's, well, the reason, of course, they use the transgender one is because they knew that a lot of the uh, conservative, so-called uh, brainwashed people would seize on it and would all get involved in the fundraising and propagation of it and, and all the heroes that day, and all the great things that the people did. And, of course, they want to look too hard at the facts or the... Uh, issues with the story or the narrative. Nope, they won't do that because they want to believe it. They want to believe this is true. They want to be able to say, finally, we as conservatives have a uh, person to point at and say, look, it was trans people do it too. Just like the individual that apparently shot up a bar in Ohio in 2020. That definitely didn't happen. And the police were so effective, they responded to the scene almost immediately and saved so many lives. Yeah, of course they can do that when the stuff didn't actually happen. Representative Andy Ogles, whose district includes Nashville, tweeted, We are sending our thoughts and prayers to the families of those lost. Father and three, I'm utterly heartbroken by this blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I don't really care anymore about the fictions. It is important to, to note the motives that these fictions would help with, right? The operations that they solidify. So you can find pretty easily the motive behind what why they do this stuff. And naturally, it's very easy when it's fictional and your understanding is fictional to pick apart the stuff. But most of the brainwashed people who want to believe it emotionally, well, they're not going to listen to you. And it doesn't matter because you don't have to explain to them. You just have to understand what, in fact, you're dealing with. And that this is a psychological operation mounted by enemy elements. So here's some more solidification is the policy debate and protests. In response to the shooting, U.S. President Joe Biden played by actors, of course. We have to do more to stop gun violence, ripping our communities apart, ripping the soul of the nation, ripping the very soul of the nation. We have to do more to protect our schools so they aren't turned into prisons. Hmm. Well, there are already prisons that extort free labor from the children. So what exactly does that mean? Do more to protect schools so they aren't turned into prisons. That's suggesting they're not already prisons, of course. He ordered flags in all federal buildings to be flown at half-staff. Nashville Mayor John Cooper called for the state to enact risk protection laws and take action on gun safety. Yeah, 
And that's what it means. Risk protection laws. The risk of them losing power. Protecting against that risk. Them losing the ability to occupy the land and undermine the security of a free state. That is what it means. Tennessee State Representative Bob Freeman, a Democrat from Nashville, called for gun reforms in the wake of the shooting. And of course, we all know this. Not something new. Protesters called for increased gun control in reaction to the shootings. On March 30, thousands of protesters gathered at the Tennessee State Capitol to call for stricter gun control laws. Thousands of protesters versus the hundreds of protesters to the ma uh, mandates, right? Just a couple hundred. This is a, a bunch of thousands. Yeah, I, I expect more like 30 people, maybe. Some children held signs saying I'm nine in reference to the age of the children shot. And, of course, naturally, they are using children for their ends. Super despicable and criminal of them, but nobody will notice because, again, they're all there because a bunch of children were killed. Because of a horrible event. And if you say that the children shouldn't be there, well, you're a monster. In the chamber of the Capitol, three state representatives, Justin Jones, Justin Peterson, and Gloria Johnson, led the public gallery in chants of no more silence. Sounds like what BLM was doing, right? We have to do better gun reform now. Silence is... is uh, I was that thing that they always said, the BLM morons. Um, something like silence is violence or something like that. These things are, are, are really illogical, but it's all about um, emotional... Uh, emotional control, con uh, psychological operations, emotional control. And naturally, there's usually a chemical element, some sort of clandestine drugging, as in Midnight Climax and MK Ultra uh, reporting and documents and stuff. Demanding that lawmakers strengthen gun laws, the protest delayed a hearing on a bill which would expand gun access on April 5th. Thousands of students across the United States demonstrated in a walkout to call lawmakers to end gun violence. Student group March of Our Lives organized walkouts across Tennessee as well as March to the state capitol. So yeah, they're mobilizing and using children as they've done before. When they get desperate, they bring out the hostages, the children. They parade them around and say, if you challenge us, and bad things are going to happen to your children, which we control. Yeah, that's not a new tactic. They've done that quite a lot throughout history. After their actions during the March 3 protest, Johnson and Jones were stripped of their committee assignments, and alongside Pearson were notified that they would be expelled from the House House Speaker Cameron Sexton, that their actions were unacceptable, breaking rules of decorum and procedure. Jones and Pearson were expelled from the House on April 6, with the vote to expel Johnson falling by a single vote. Within a week, they were reinstated in interim capacities. The National Metropolitan Council unanimously voted to reinstate Jones. The Shelby County Board of Commissioners unanimously voted to reinstate Pierce in the expulsion. Interim reinstatement guard national attention. Yes, of course, it is because they promoted it. And what's funny is that I actually heard absolutely nothing about this stuff until now because I looked up things like this on Wikipedia when it came to fake bans, and I had no idea that any of this stuff was going on because... I try my best to avoid any of this nonsense and to watch the so-called fake news media. So um, then the state legislature, pa legislature passed bills designed to improve safety measures at schools in March. It passed a law allowing private schools to hire school resource officers from police departments to help prevent shootings effective immediately. Yep. Hire bodyguards. That's what that is. Using so-called tax money. Doesn't matter if you agree with these schools because now they have occupying thugs to put guns in your face. If you're a father and you come to take your school out of the or your child out of the school because they don't want you doing that, then you're going to have these school resource officers to contend with. What does that sound like? Sounds like they're making sure that the schools get even more turned into prisons, and that this time that it's not going to be any games being played because they're going to have force. And naturally, they'll have stronger control over people's children who would otherwise disagree with what they're doing, but the, considering they hold the children as hostage, they can get you to do whatever you want by threatening your children. In April, the legislature passed a bill allocating $230 million towards school safety, including a place to place school resource officers in every school the bill was signed into law on May 8th. Or in May. On August 8, 2023, Governor Bill Lee officially called for a special session of the General Assembly to be held in August 21 to focus on public safety response to the shooting. Of course they did. 
and all of this is in Tennessee. This entirely has to do with psychological operation against people who live in Tennessee, and these things are going to be played out across the rest of the country as well, because the people that pretend to be government are not, they're foreign agents, and they work together with entities inside of the churches. And these elements right here prove that. This, of course, and many other elements of evidence, as can be found in most of my other videos. In the immediate aftermath of the shooting, police officers connected what was initially described as a manifesto authored by Hale, David Rausch, director of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. That's R-A-U-S-C-H. It's interesting. Later called the descriptor a mischaracterization describing the writings as document detailing Hale's plan and journal type ranting. The MMPD denied requests for the files of the Tennessean and the state senator Todd Garden Hire. Oh, these names are so stupid. Just like Deadman showing up to be your attorney. And then you, you know, suicide yourself. <laughs> Who argued along with some open government advocates that Tennessee's public records laws required the release of the writings. Metro Nashville Council member Courtney Johnson or John Sten, that the FBI had told her the documents would not be released because they detailed a blueprint of total destruction and could inspire other shooters. Of course, a lot of people are saying nowadays that the FBI is not around anymore, but that doesn't matter when you're creating complete fiction. Several Tennessee politicians and public figures, including Elon Musk and Donald Trump Jr., publicly called for the release of the documents. Uh, of course, because, uh, you know, different caricatures are, are going to weigh in so that they add more weight to the fraud. Senator Bill Haggerty said, I think people do deserve to know what took place and what was in the mind of the sick person that committed these heinous murders. Yes, of course, people deserve to know. People in general deserve to know what took place. Because nothing took place. It's all about, yeah, well, you know. House Republican Caucus Chairman Jeremy Faison attributed the lack of legislative response to the shootings to be delayed, really saying we cannot possibly address the horrific situation until we know what was in the manifesto. Hmm. Perhaps the manifesto writers have kind of dropped off. One has to wonder. On April 28, 2023, Tennessee Governor Bill Lee announced that per his communications with Drake, the writings would be released very soon. Hmm. I wonder if they ever will. Kind of like the... Uh, phony Game of Thrones writer who couldn't finish the last book because that person is an actor and never wrote any of them to begin with. And the Tennessee Firearms Association, of course, they're involved. National Police Association and Tennessee Firearms Association. Go figure. All the little juridic entities all working together. Just like the NRA is behind a lot of criminal undermining of the security of free state. Separately filed suit to obtain the writings, the MNPD announced that in the face of pending litigation, it would delay the release of the on the advice of counsel. This is, of course, more fake bans generate uh, interest around this. This Covenant School sought to intervene in both cases to protect sensitive information owned by the Covenant School from being released in collection of Covenant parents representing 75% of the families at the school. A collection of Covenant parents representing 75% of the families of the school. So they always play these games. They always like to do things uh, on behalf of one or another so that if you look at it, you find out it's not them. But that's fine because they're doing it on behalf. You know, and it says it's representing. Doesn't mean it is. It is not 75% of the families at the school. It's representing 75% of the families at the school. So who represents the other 25% according to them? Sought to provide argument that the writings, even in redacted form, should not be released at all. The judge granted the request to intervene by the school and the parents. Of course. Of course they did. Because this is all about f facilitating and establishing the control and the protection for the church school system. On November 6, 2023, images of three pages of Haley's diary, Hale's diary were released by conservative commentator Stephen Crowder, Nashville Police Chief John Drake confirmed the authenticity of the images, and Nashville Mayor Freddie O'Connell directed Nashville's Department of Law to investigate how these images could have been released. The leaks showed that Hale was hoping a high death count had stated desire to kill the crackers, and that I can't even say that word, otherwise the stupid YouTube is going to... Well, it does it anyway, so... But then it might be like, oh, you can't have this video because you used no no word. Anyway, and white privilege. Okay, so it looks like they released a, a portion. Because, of course, you don't need a 
specially practiced manifesto writer to create a portion, right? And uh, naturally, the um, so-called law enforcement people are involved in these frauds uh, with through their connections to the Knights of Columbus and fraternal orders and nonsense, all that nonsense. 